Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Ganey, uh, Executive Chair at Canada 2020, and it is uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this event this afternoon on Canada's Rural Economic and Community Development Strategy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today in Ottawa, part of the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Canada 2020 is grateful to convene and work in this community and many others across Turtle Island and to continue uh, adding to its rich history of exchange in person and in this virtual setting today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Canada 2020's partners without whom today's discussion would not be possible. A particular thanks to TELUS for their support of this project and to Air Canada for their generous support. Post-pandemic progress is a big topic these days, and today we're here to discuss what, as you well know, a, a sustainable, inclusive, and digital future for rural Canada. With this project, we are focused on the best practices and the best ideas. Uh, Canada has a tremendous chance to lead uh, in understanding rural communities as places of community wealth, opportunity, and inclusive growth. And we're here to talk about how to get that right. So some housekeeping, the agenda for the afternoon was sent out Monday via email, so please check your inbox for that. Uh, today's sessions, we hope for a robust and animated conversation and not just uh, amongst our esteemed panelists. So uh, the final 15 minutes of each panel will involve a Q&A. Uh, for you to participate in that, there are two ways. One is to enter your question directly into the chat uh, and the moderator will read the question out or to raise your hand with the Zoom function and um, be prepared for the moderator to call on you. So turn on your camera and your, your microphone. So whichever uh, way you're more comfortable with uh, asking a question, it's uh, entirely up to you and uh, we'll leave that for you to decide. So on that note, let's get into it. Uh, before our first panel, I have the pleasure of introducing Matthew Mendelson, a Canada 2020 Senior Fellow and really the brains behind this project. So he will give us a little more framing and context before he uh, moderates this first panel. So thank you all again very much for joining us. I look forward to this uh, conversation this afternoon with all of you. And on that note, uh, over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, for us a really exciting uh, project. As, uh, as you know, this has been a really challenging 20 months for, for many people in many different contexts. Um, but at Canada 2020, I think uh, we focused on the issue of community development, economic development in rural and smaller communities. Started thinking about this uh, a few months ago. I personally have you know, been involved with economic development policy and program design for, for 20 years, but in no way an expert in uh, in rural issues, um, and have we have spent uh, the last few months uh, engaging with many of the scholars and practitioners and researchers and many of the people uh, who are here uh, today with deep expertise uh, in these issues and have been working on them uh, for decades. And one of the things that I uh, think is very exciting about Canada 2020 and the work they do, and when Canada 2020 is at its best, uh, is when uh, we bring together and convene people with deep expertise and researchers and practitioners working on the ground and executing programs and delivering projects uh, and connect them with policymakers and decision makers um, and uh, create much more robust uh, actionable conversations and, and projects. And, you know, personally, I think when we can bring people with research expertise and delivery practice together with policymakers and decision makers, uh, we come up with better solutions and we come up with better solutions that, uh, that can work. And clearly, uh, questions of rural economic development are front and center uh, of many people's minds uh, at the moment. So uh, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone, uh, you know, who we spoke to over the last several months. Uh, we've done a number of different workshops and engagements, uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, and trying to understand as best as we can the many issues, challenges, and opportunities um, uh, that uh, are, are currently facing communities of all different sizes in Canada. Um, and we're really looking forward to continuing this dialogue over the next few months. We put out a discussion paper uh, uh, last week. Uh, and we will continue to try and build a, a robust policy and program agenda um, with input from people with uh, with real expertise and practice um, uh, delivering uh, delivering programs. 
before we get to the first uh, panel, I just want to make uh, you know five quick, short, contextual comments to try and frame uh, the three panels that we are about to have. The first one uh, is that um, the pandemic has uh, encouraged many of us to think about what's important, uh, how government uh, can act and support uh, individuals and communities. The government, uh, the federal government put out uh, a rural economic development strategy in 2019, and now is a good time to think about uh, what we have learned over the last 20 months, uh, how communities uh, and individuals have changed, and um, whether there are aspects of that strategy that need to be accentuated or highlighted uh, or things that need to be added to. Uh, the second observation I would make is that there are clearly lots of public narratives out there at the moment around uh, what this pandemic has meant for communities of all different sizes and digital connectivity and work from home uh, and uh, and distributed workforces and um, uh, and pressures on housing have uh, caused many people to ask whether some of the historic advantages over the last 50 years for economic development that have benefited uh, urban areas, whether some of those things are uh, turning on uh, their head or being reversed. I certainly don't know the answer to that, but I think it, uh, it uh, warrants attention and we should engage with those narratives with people with expertise on those questions. Um, third, uh, is the um, the importance of the social contract and inclusion for all Canadians. I think the last 20 months has shown us how, you know, we all need to be in this together and that there are real obligations for governments, private sector organizations, community organizations, that we all have uh, duties and obligations to one another. And inclusion, which is important to, to this government, um, needs to be understood in its broadest sense possible. And that means that Canadians in communities of all different sizes need to feel and see themselves included in the programs and policies uh, that the governments articulate. Uh, the, the fourth observation I'd make is, uh, you know, in our discussion paper, uh, we deal with the new uh, framework that the OECD put out on rural economic development, uh, which really focuses on well-being and quality of life and the quality of public services, not just the ability to attract the signature investment and build jobs and economies around that, but the overall community wealth, well-being, uh, and quality of life for people who live in rural and smaller communities. So certainly interested in engaging in that framework. Um, and finally, uh, I think it bears mentioning that the most important principle in all of this discussion uh, is agency for people and agency for people who live in communities and. Uh, 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 how government can translate policies and programs in ways where individuals and communities uh, in rural areas, smaller communities, mid-sized cities have agency, decision-making control, uh, and uh, and access to resources to uh, to implement the programs and policies uh, and projects that are important to them. So, with those uh, contextual framing uh, bits, uh, we can get to the uh, the main part of uh, of our day. We have three panels today. Uh, the first. First panel I am going to chair, uh, and uh, I think of it as kind of a scene setter um, to think about you know what we've learned over the last twelve months, uh, over the last twenty months, and what that might mean for government programs and policies for the federal government, for provincial territorial governments, but likewise for private sector and not for profits uh, as well. So uh, I think we're taking a fifteen second break. Um, while we get set up for uh, the first panel, and then I will uh, introduce them. So thank you very much for joining us. Welcome back. Did you miss me? Um, so uh, we're off to the uh, first panel. Uh, as I say, this is uh, we think of as a context setter about changes, uh, learnings, uh, opportunities, challenges that have really become apparent uh, over the over the past twenty months, and uh, early thoughts on uh, you know what government needs to prioritize uh, over over the coming years. We'll then have uh, two additional panels, one with a, a focus on community well-being and community wealth building uh, and quality of life in rural communities, and then another panel on uh, innovation uh, and capital investment in, uh, in rural communities. So I'm super excited about uh, the people on this panel. Um, I have learned a great deal 
from uh, all of them, and I have been reading their work, um, certainly the academics, uh, over the last uh, over the last year, and uh, always following uh, uh, the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Carol's work um, on the ground, and have had pleasure to work with her previously. Um, so let me just introduce the panelists quickly, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, they, they have shown some flexibility when we decided to, to move to digital. Um, and I think this is working okay. Um, and hopefully it will continue to work okay. Um, so uh, our first panelist is Kathleen Keveney, who's an associate professor and director of rural research collaboration uh, at Dalhousie University in the Faculty of Agriculture, where she specializes in sustainable diets, well-being, and systems analysis. She's on advisory boards for the Canadian Food Studies, Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems, and Community Development. Um, I got to know Kathleen because she has just completed her term as president of the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, which does, uh, which does a lot of engagement and conferences. And I know uh, she's going to mention uh, their upcoming uh, conference in May in, uh, in Ramouski. Um, uh, uh, Sean Markey is a professor and certified planner with the School of Resource and Environment Management at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Sean has been working in this area and a leading thinker um, uh, for decades. Son, Sean's research concerns issues of local and regional economic development, rural and small town development, and sustainable planning and infrastructure. He uh, really is one of uh, Canada's leading experts on sustainable community and regional development. Uh, he's published several books. I was a failed academic for a while and I never managed to publish a book. I started three books. I've completed none of them. Um, so I have great admiration um, uh, for the fact that Sean was able to finish books. Um, and uh, those books have focused on rural economic development, place-based approaches, investing in rural communities, with a particular focus in uh, on rural and, uh, and northern British Columbia. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have gotten to know Ashley Whedon recently, who is a rural futurist and a community builder, uh, who is, as she keeps saying, finishing up her doctorate um, at the University of Guelph with fingers crossed um, with a focus on place-based rural innovation and policy foresight, um, uh, thinking about the future of, of community and um, uh, planning and preparing and shaping it. Uh, she's also the editor and project coordinator for the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation's series of research reports on the impact of COVID and on rural communities, which has been, uh, which has been very helpful uh, over the last few months. Uh, and uh, then we're very fortunate to have Carol Saab with us, uh, who brings a somewhat different approach and a practitioner's lens as CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, Carol, uh, I know many of you know, Carol has been uh, engaged with and at the forefront uh, of working for municipalities for a very long time. And I've had the privilege of working her, working with her uh, on a couple of different issues over the past decade. Um, and um, she is an accomplished uh, strategist with a decade of experience in federal uh, and municipal advocacy and uh, has really been a driving force uh, in many of the important uh, debates and policy decisions discussions that have impacted municipalities and the municipal level, level of government uh, over, the past, uh, over the past decade. And I know that uh, over the past 20 months, she's been very closely engaged with uh, and supporting and advocating for rural municipalities uh, across the country. Um, and so we're very happy to have her and bring, uh, you know, bring not only her voice, but I think, and uh, I hope I'm not speaking uh, for her out of turn, but also bring the voice of uh, rural municipalities and political leaders and public servants who are working in smaller and rural municipalities across the country and the kind of issues and challenges they're facing. So uh, with that introduction, I'm very happy to have you all here. Um, and uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, just ask all of you um, kind of an introductory question and I'll ask Kathleen to speak to it first and then, uh, and then Ashley and then Sean, and then maybe Carol uh, can come in. Um, uh, and that is just about the last 20 months and thinking about what you know about a rural and uh, uh, about economic and community development in rural and uh, smaller communities. Um, what has the last 20 months taught you about 
uh, where we need to be moving, uh, where things are changing, and what role you think government needs to take um, and where priorities need to be placed. I know that's a big open-ended question, but I wanted to give each of you a chance to just kind of reflect on the past 20 months uh, in the context of your work um, and, and building stronger uh, rural communities. Kathleen? Great. Well, it's a real privilege to be here and thank you, Matthew, and to the team. I really appreciate um, efforts that um, get into the muddiness and the weedy bits of systems thinking. And I can see this work of Canada 2020 is really um, striving to uncover opportunities and challenges for rural Canada. So I'm privileged to do this work from Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And uh, we work together for reconciliation and respect. So I want to uh, just frame a bit of the ideas that we're bringing from um, the Atlantic perspective, as well as my own areas of specialty. And of course, I will be waving the flag of CERF, the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, which is a preeminent national Canadian network focused on enhancing rural quality of life through data, informed decision making. Some of the best thinkers are on this call. So we're very fortunate to have assembled as you have this team, you know, excluding myself, of course. Uh, SURF is offering uh, sound pathways for deliberation around these issues. So I do want to point to, as you mentioned in your remarks, Matthew, that um, we are looking at ways to really highlight rural concerns and rural opportunities. So SURF prepares policy briefs. Um, we have several meetings with uh, government departments around the year. Uh, we were working on building partnerships across the country and hosting critical debates and our prominent conference. So we do seek uh, to bring really the best thinking around uh, what are the pressing issues for rural Canada. And I know all of us will be speaking to that here. Um, so most recently, we, under the leadership of Dr. Kyle Reich, we had a conference very much in alignment with today's conference. And we are really proud to co-host with CDEC, the Community Economic Development and Employability uh, Corporation of Quebec. And it was a really profound, inspiring conference and the title, Increasing Inclusive uh, Economies, Building Bridges Between Public, Private and Civil Society Sectors. So of course, this means we're all in it together. So certainly COVID, shone great light on the necessity for us to be working collaboratively, all sectors. Um, and it's a, a real opportunity today to give a shout out to the next continuation of that strong partnership through the second conference, May 25th to the 27th in Rimouski in the Belle Provence. Uh, so uh, we are sharing with you the um, Invitation, you'll receive that in your notes for coming to Ramuski in person or again online. So some of the pressing issues that came up during the assembly of these speakers was that reconciliation and equity. And I think uh, you have really underscored the importance of this issue, Matthew. Inclusion and compassion need to be driving principles uh, for Canadian policy and practices. If we do not get that right, um, everything else is falling apart and all speak frequently to the necessity for systems thinking. And we need to draw upon a range of um, experience and ways of forming knowledge, including Indigenous um, perspectives, so that we're building communities that are inclusive and resilient. And all of the speakers really underscored the importance of moving beyond past practices to really amplify rural assets and to leverage uh, the strengths in place that it be uh, people focused and um, that we really look at possibilities with a broader and a far bolder um, perspective. That place based needs to be the foundation that is um, building on these actions. So engaging communities, um, certainly priorities that I would speak to later in this call too are around food security and food sufficiency, which COVID shone great light on, leading to real critical um, framing around food sustainability in Canada. Um, health and improvement of our conditions for well-being. I know Danny Graham will speak to that later, but I think more emphasis needs to be uh, brought to bear by government and all of us thinking about uh, communicable diseases, but also non-communicable diseases and actions we should be taking together. And I think climate change and prevention strategies, we still don't hear enough about prevention. Yes, of course, 
rural communities are at the forefront of where we also need to mitigate. So we really need um, all departments, all hands on deck to strive for strategies around reducing the adversity of climate creation, climate change impact that's adverse, as well as um, finding ways to, uh, to move through that. So I don't know, I can go on, of course, but I want to pause there, Matthew, and see if uh, we want to. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. That was a really good overview of some of the work that uh, you've been doing. Um, and I really want to come back to uh, the theme of leveraging rural assets and the strength in place that you talked about. Obviously, we'll probably talk about many of the issues that, that you raised, but I really want to, uh, to, to come back to that uh, in, in a moment. But I did want to turn to Ashley, um, and you have been doing research over the last, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, if if you uh, could pull out uh, a few key pieces uh, of insight uh, that you've been uh, sharing with with your networks uh, about the impact uh, of of COVID on rural communities and the implications, uh, that would be really helpful for us. Yes, and and thank you so much. I mean, uh, what an act to follow, uh, Kathleen, and also to be on a panel with Carol and Sean uh, and yourself. Uh, you know, getting to hang out with some of my my personal heroes is always a good thing. Um, and I've gotten to work with many of you over the last 20 months and indeed over the last several years. Um, and, and I think that's really what I want to highlight about what we found through the COVID-19 Insight Series with SURF and through a lot of the other work that I've been doing is that none of it was new. The reason we were able to mobilize the knowledge that we did and the network that we did so quickly is because researchers connected with SURF and rural researchers around the world have been essentially saying the same thing for more or less the last 50 to 75 years around what we actually need to do to support uniquely rural futures. And so when we come down with the recommendations around what needs to be done through any of those topic-specific insight papers or through things like our engagement with the last federal election or any of these kinds of priority-setting agendas, it sounds really simple and straightforward, right? Affordable housing food security, transportation, infrastructure, uh, quality of life and an affordable quality of life around standard of care, duty of care by governments. These are not new concepts. What the pandemic did was really kind of grab a lot of people in decision-making roles by the shoulders and sort of shake them a bit and say, what are you going to do about it? Because what we saw is really this exacerbation of existing challenges. So in 2018, um, the economic geographer, um, Andre rodriguez Pose called it, you know, the revenge of places that don't matter when we talk about sort of increasing polarization of rural and remote regions versus urban centers. And we really need to look at who's making decisions about and for rural places. Where do the power dynamics shift in favor of? And we've really seen the consequences of increasing centralization of economic and political power over the last several decades and what that means for sort of a hollowing out of the power for rural communities. Rural communities know what's best for them. They know what they want to do. They know the things that work for them. We're just not listening to them and enabling and empowering that through official institutional means. So my three points always that have come out of, you know, the incredible work of colleagues like Karen Foster at Dalhousie and the people that are sitting on this panel and across the surf network is always kind of you know, three key questions, which is like, do we value rural places and how do we value them? Do we only value them insofar as they provide food and energy and a, and a way to sort of manage our guilt about climate change? Or do we actually value them as unique and interesting parts of our social and economic and political fabric? And what does that mean to sort of re-embed self-defined and self-determined value in rural places? The second bit is, you know, what does it mean to shift from supporting rural communities to recognizing the right to be rural? And so this comes from uh, Karen Foster's work and Laura Baraclaw as well. And, and I've been lucky enough to get to work with, with Karen on advancing some of these ideas is what does it mean to shift from we're doing these things to sort of help rural regions catch up or be nice instead of saying that you have a right to exist in, in your rural community. And that right means that you shouldn't accept a lesser quality of health care, lesser standards of infrastructure, lesser access to meaningful lives and livelihoods. So if we reframe this as a rights-based framework, how does that change the way we talk about, treat, and view rural places? And then finally, who gets to decide? And this is really important to me because a lot of contemporary economic development strategies are still fundamentally exploited, right? We look at tourism, that's just consuming place, right? We look at um, 
any sort of revitalization of downtowns. Well, you know, gentrification by any other name is still just gentrification. So how do we define the priority setting and who gets to set that agenda is really important. And if it's just the people with the most means who are able to buy up real estate and turn it into a bookstore or a hotel or a boutique um, versus what the community really needs and wants, we have a problem. And so investment is good, but we need to look at the spillovers of those kinds of investment. What happens when we revitalize a downtown and that necessitates greater property taxes in order to invest in the appropriate infrastructure to service that downtown in the small town or the rural community? How much do people push back against that? Where does that come from? Are the people that are driving that actually participating? And so finally, I would say like, I've been on all sides of this, right? I worked in rural economic development for the first third of my career before coming back to my PhD to look at this. I've been involved with business owners. I've been involved with government. I've been involved on the academic side. There's no right answer. There's a lot of really complex actions that we can take. And what we lose when we sort of say, this is the only way is that complexity around moving forward. And when I come out of this, and as I'm looking at this, you know, finishing up my dissertation, as we're getting there, and <laughs> stuff with, you know, COVID-19, and we're looking at what this all means, is that we have to decouple growth and development from thriving and success. Our only vision of success right now is sort of framed around rapid urbanization and unfettered growth. Well, there are limits to growth. So what does it mean to decouple our ideas of rural success and a thriving rural and remote you know, kind of place or community from this notion of things always have to be expanding, always have to be being revitalized, always have to be um, kind of being reinvested in. And instead, what does it mean to position this as a unique place based on its own determination and agenda? And finally, you know, I'd say as we move forward, I look forward to hearing from Sean and from Carol and, and from all of us as well is, you know, how do we renegotiate these discussions? So that decisions made in at Queen's Park or Parliament Hill are actually about devolving appropriate power and resources to the people who are most affected by those decisions. Right now, nothing really changes by remote work or people moving to rural regions. And in fact, we're actually replicating the crises of housing affordability and issues of affordability in general in rural regions from urban places. And I'm to blame, you know, when I worked in economic development, I said, you know, come move here, it's cheaper. And, you know, but my view on that has changed because what happens when we displace those people? So nothing changes if nothing changes and we know what we need to do. And what we need to do is kind of unhook from trickle down economics, uh, paint it over with different names and move to actually place-based, asset-based, community-based recognition of what we need to build our future on. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley. There is a lot... Uh, in there that I want to uh, pick up on. Uh, but again, like I, I did with Kathleen, a couple things that uh, I want you to think about because um, I might probe and um, it, Sean might want to pick up on uh, these as well. But the, the right to be rural, the idea of uh, decoupling growth from success, um, how we devolve and create agency and autonomy, um, and the role of digital, um, which obviously does enable some things, but uh, uh, there are also challenges or uh, problems that could get reproduced. But obviously, digital, on the other hand, creates more opportunity for digital delivery of services and equal access to services. So there are a number of things I, I probably follow up with on all of the panel. Uh, but Sean, I'll just uh, turn it over to you based on what you've been hearing and um, uh, uh, listening to. And you've spent a lot of time talking about the importance of place and leveraging assets as well. Um, uh, where do you think we are in this discussion and where we need to move forward, uh, given your, your deep experience in this, uh, you know, coming, coming out of the pandemic, but also, uh, as you know, um, uh, confronted with, with uh, climate-related um, uh, emergencies and impacts in rural and smaller communities uh, near where you are, but obviously uh, across the country? Yeah, thanks very much, Matthew. And thank you for the invitation to participate. It's a wonderful gathering of thinkers and people. Uh, I'd also like to thank you uh, for your focus on rural communities. I think as rural researchers and everyone associated with rural development, we're thrilled when that attention and that gaze gets put on rural places, uh, which are often sort of absent that, that type of uh, focus. 
Uh, I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. I was thrilled to sort of see reconciliation powerfully represented in the discussion paper. Um, and we are certainly driven by a moral imperative to do so. Uh, but if we also truly listen, uh, Indigenous knowledge holders offer, I think, insights into what a sustainable society can truly look like in Canada. Uh, congratulations to Canada 2020 on the discussion paper. Um, uh, I'm, I apologize, Matthew, for having to slog through some of that academic material. Um, but uh, I, I thought it, you've I've done a wonderful job and uh, a real meaningful treatise on the value and potential of place-based rural development. Uh, I think also we need to acknowledge the, the efforts in, uh, uh, done by the Minister of uh, Rural Economic Development, um, uh, former Minister Jordan and Minister Hutchings. Uh, you know, I think the 2019 statement and the recent updates uh, outline an excellent document. It, it provides some real insights into the rural condition. Uh, I think their their theme identification in terms of areas for investment are very well, well articulated. Uh, and um, in particular, some of the efforts around governance in terms of trying to instill a rural lens on government decision making holds uh, tremendous potential. Uh, moving forward. I think both documents also speak to a revival of collaboration between the rural research community and policy uh, systems and policy community. Uh, that's ob obviously represented by the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, but also the excellent work done by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. It's wonderful to see this evidence, this data, this type of thinking reflected in these policy documents going forward. Uh, you know, moving on to your more specific question, Matthew, um, I think the, as, as Ashley mentioned, in terms of sort of illustrating or exacerbating tensions or challenges that already existed, 30 to 40 years of a more neoliberal orientation to our government systems has clearly kicked a lot of problems down the road. And uh, those were revealed, uh, uh, you know, in terms of infrastructure weaknesses, for example, in health, education, broadband, transportation, uh, that a lot of rural municipalities have been struggling with for years. Uh, it is also, I think, that that sort of uh, withdrawal of, of government attention, government investment, government convening roles has also ingrained, I think, and perhaps exacerbated a deep skepticism in rural places about the re regarding the role of governments. So we're in this sort of catch-22 scenario where we're seeking to revitalize and return to a more investment mentality in our government processes and in our policies, but there's skepticism in rural places around how that's going to be done and whether that type of meaningful investment will actually take place and will benefit rural places. Uh, as, as, as much of the challenges have been revealed, I think it's also revealed the, the tremendous potential of rural places, not simply in terms of the importance to GDP, as your paper really nicely outlines, uh, but in other dimensions in terms of ecosystem services, for example, uh, that I think is uh, perhaps under, underrepresented in this work. We've seen, uh, I know from some of my own research and with colleagues right across the country, uh, the tremendous role and power of the nonprofit and community association sectors and picking up some of the slack uh, that um, that you know government withdrawals has has exacerbated and, and led to over the last number of decades. Uh, those institutions and those associations are under tremendous power uh, pressure. Uh, it speaks perhaps to sort of some of the other linkage across government portfolios in terms of the importance of the social finance role, for example. Uh, but these organizations and associations, particularly under the pandemic crisis, have, have played just monumental roles in maintaining community resilience. Uh, and I think in many regards, they're, they're uh, absorbing functions that are really and should be government responsibilities. Uh, I, I mentioned briefly the, the value of intact and restored ecosystems. We're certainly seeing that in British Columbia, very unfortunately, over the past month, been devastated by flooding, uh, which speaks again to sort of decades of uh, land use and forest mismanagement, uh, in addition to some of the challenges of maintaining, even maintaining critical infrastructures, let alone investing in those infrastructure systems to, be, um, uh, to accommodate uh, the vagaries of climate change. Uh, and, you know, I think, unfortunately, also what we're seeing is um, uh, pressures and, and forms of development that are moving forward, uh, not taking these lessons into consideration. 
the, the pressures to alleviate some of the rural housing crisis by simply building more sprawl, uh, pressure under the uh, green belt system and urban containment boundaries in Ontario to facilitate more sprawl. These are extremely corrosive to community resilience in rural places that are expensive immediately and extremely uh, challenging for all of us in terms of public expense going into the future of a much more uh, difficult climate change period. Uh, in terms of the rural economic development implications, as I mentioned, this, this term, I'd like to sort of really um, accentuate a return to an investment mentality, uh, which is really, really critical. It's what rural communities, I think, have been calling for for decades. Uh, I think similarly to Ashley's uh, allusion to the issue of growth, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with the concept of inclusive growth. Certainly the, the, the uh, concepts of inclusion and returning to a more equity-inspired principle of how we seek to invest in rural places is critically important. Uh, but the sustainable often gets dropped from that. And uh, it'll be interesting as the day proceeds to sort of uh, drill into those, uh, that connection between growth and well-being and what that actually looks like in rural places. Uh, in terms of areas for continued work, just to finish up, I, I think there's a lack of integration with the provinces. Uh, there's been efforts at SURF and uh, policy roundtables, for example, um, led by um, uh, Dr. Ryan Gibson to try to create those, those networks, but so much of the rural condition is dependent upon provincial jurisdiction, and, and we need to see federal and uh, provincial jurisdictions working together uh, and in a much better and more cohesive way. Uh, I appreciate the what we heard dimensions of the rural economic development strategy, for example, but in, in reality, I think there's very limited rural engagement and a result, I think, uh, quite a limited awareness about this strategy in rural places. Uh, and then finally, I have a complete love-hate relationship with vision statements. Uh, they're incredibly important, uh, but often done very poorly. And um, as I've noted with colleagues in, in other writings in the past, is that we've been lacking a vision of what rural Canada is going to look like going into the future. Uh, and as difficult it is to accommodate that, given the diversity of rurals, which is well represented in the place-based document, uh, that type of vision can be incredibly important in aligning and marshalling different interests together into uh, a common purpose. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, join again, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you so much, Sean. Again, uh, lots uh, to unpack there. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm looking at the chat as well, certainly lots of people are interested in probing that question of growth. Um, and uh, you raised the question of inclusive growth. Obviously, inclusion is good, but uh, how does that work from a sustainability lens? And also the return to investment mentality. And um, I think that will be uh, something really important to, to probe. And then kind of as a bridge, um, to Carol, uh, I think the other point you raise is about governance um, and how federal and provincial governments work together. It's something that I know Carol navigates every day, um, but uh, discussing, uh, you know, the role of the federal government, the role of the provincial government, um, how they collaborate, how they create tables uh, together, how they create tables together with municipalities, whether we have recovery tables with rural communities, provincial governments, federal governments uh, that can take that kind of uh, collaborative approach. I mean, I think those are all, uh, you know, important questions to probe because uh, I think, uh, from my perspective, we certainly, uh, over the next couple of months and coming out of this day, want to have, for, from my perspective, some kind of actions that we think we are, you know, encouraging governments and others to, to adopt. So uh, with that segue, um, like Johnny Carson here, good segue here to our next guest. Um, Johnny Carson suggests uh, I'm much older than uh, I want to acknowledge. So Carol, we're very happy to have you here. You've been on the front lines of these issues for the last uh, 20 months and working with your members uh, who are facing the, the real challenges um, that, uh, you know, that uh, we all experience or talk about. Um, so uh, based on what you've heard so far and, you know, your work, um, uh, what uh, are rural municipalities telling you about uh, what they need and where we need to move forward in the role of the federal government in that? 
Okay, thanks very much, Matthew. And I'll also start by saying a big thank you to Canada 2020 for hosting uh, this important discussion. I'm honestly just so pleased to see this conversation happening uh, and to be part of such an impressive and really thoughtfully curated panel. So a big thank you to the organizers here. Uh, I'm joining you as well from my offices our first week back uh, and our FCM offices are located in downtown Ottawa, which is on the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Um, you know, I was listening carefully and everybody sort of touched on on the fact that the the pandemic has really, you know, actually saying taken us by the shoulders and given us a shake. And I think part of the message that we are all individually and collectively taking um, back is the importance of local communities in our daily lives. You know, they're where we've all faced COVID-19 head on. They're where our frontline workers became our heroes. We've seen all of this play out in a very localized way um, over the past 20 months here. And I've got a real privilege as a CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to, to get a bit of a bird's eye view across the country. Of, of what's happening. And I can tell you, I have seen rural municipal leaders uh, step forward in a very big way to keep people safe um, and to start driving a recovery that's necessary. You know, in the, right from the outset, in the in the start of the pandemic, you know, I can give you a couple quick um, anecdotal stories. You know, Canton de Gaulle in Quebec, a very small community, um, out of the gate, set up a home delivery service for seniors and vulnerable residents at the height of the lockdown, which made an incredible difference to the lives of those in their community. The town of Vermilion, Alberta, um, became an ISP, built their own fiber network uh, to help drive the sort of growth and opportunity and connect in the agriculture sector, but also provide those connection options for their residents. You know, our president this year is Joanne Vander Hayden, and she's uh, the mayor of Strathroy Caradoc, a small town in, in Ontario. And uh, a number of uh, their sort of adjoining communities, I um, mean, really regionally have come together to build uh, quite an impressive sort of regional transportation network um, for them. And I was talking to her about, you know, how is it that you guys are doing this in the height of a pandemic? You're figuring out how to do that. And she just looked at me very sort of, you know, as, as she does and said, well, you just do. That's what we've got to do in small towns. We just do. And I can tell you, I hear that from rural leaders um, across the country and a particular shout out to the rural women um, who are leading. They do just do and they know and they can because they know exactly what works for them. And so I think the notion of place based decision making and policies is so critical um, because we've got we've got the ideas, we've got the innovations. We just need to be listening to Ashley's point and figuring out how to scale them and enable them um, across the country. You know, and I'll say at the same time as I've been able to see sort of that kind of innovation coming from rural Canada, it's the pandemic also really exposed the unique challenges rural communities face um, and particularly how urgent those challenges are. You know, at a time when everybody was saying stay home and many Canadians went online for work and school, there are about 2 million people in rural and remote Indigenous communities who couldn't join them because they still can't access reliable high-speed internet. I mean... <laughs> It's just unfathomable when you think about it in the context of the pandemic. And this has been a longstanding issue um, in the Canadian context. And I'll tell you quite honestly, nearly every rural mayor I speak to um, for a long time and certainly early on in the start of this pandemic all the way through tell, would say that this is their community's biggest challenge. Um, and, you know, at FCM, we've been we've been pushing this for a long time. We've been advocating around it. We've been you know really instrumental in driving repeated expansions of the Universal Broadband Fund. There's obviously a lot more work to do, so I know we'll come back to that kind of a theme around um, enabling enabling communities in the digital context. Um, the pandemic also showed really all of us, uh, regardless of size in, in local government, how vulnerable we are to serious economic shock. You know, again, very limited fiscal tools in local government, razor thin margins, uh, and more. You know, no ability to run deficits. And so when the first wave happened local revenues plummeted and in weeks, and that's not an exaggeration, I mean, it took mere weeks for municipalities to be on the brink of real financial crisis. In rural communities with even fewer resources, with older populations, I mean, that really became very quickly about how, how were they gonna be able to keep people safe? It became harder in that context. Um, and so, you know, it, we've got a lot of work to do. We're learning in real time, as we always do. Rural communities are at their core resilient. Um, and coming out of COVID, we're hearing they know and they want to and they need support to become even more resilient and not just to sort of the next um, health shock, but to economic shocks, to climate shocks, as we're seeing uh, in various parts across the country. 
and I think underscoring the premise of the work, which again, I'll add my, uh, I'll add my kudos uh, to those of our, my fellow panelists here, a really important uh, piece of work you pulled together there. There really can't be a nationwide recovery without thriving, resilient rural communities. And, you know, to put it very bluntly, a one size fits all approach isn't going to cut it. We need rural solutions to rural challenges. And that's from everything ensuring, you know, smaller municipalities can access, you know, disaster mitigation funding, um, replacing regional bus routes that connect rural communities and their economies. You know, and uh, this was raised by Sean earlier. This is what we at FCM have long been pushing for and advocated for around a rural lens. Um, which, you know, there's a lot of conversation about what that means, but quite practically, it means federal policies and, pro uh, and programs that account for rural realities and bringing rural leaders to the table more often when those solutions and programs and policies are being developed. And ultimately, it means really directly empowering municipal leaders including rural municipal leaders um, who are closest to, to those in their communities with the flexibility, the funding tools that they need to meet their local needs. Um, and so two weeks ago, uh, we released also a, our document or a call Partners for Canada's Recovery. It's our roadmap for really a, an inclusive and hopefully sustainable recovery. Um, and it's got a suite of frontline solutions for rural economic development, for rural climate resilience, uh, for bringing this rural lens to the recovery. And you'll see that echoed in the themes of sort of municipal finance and broadband and housing and transportation and infrastructure. Um, so I know we'll be getting into some of these uh, some of these solutions today. Uh, really, the point that, you know, I think all of us will be driving in our own ways is that economic growth, rural economic growth and, and wellness in a rural context is, is economic growth for the whole country, is wellness for our whole country. And our recovery depends on it. And the future we build depends on it. And rural municipal leaders really are essential partners to driving that. And they're ready to, to get to work. You know, Ashley, I really appreciate when you were talking about moving away from the frame of, you know, how do we support, you know, in a needs-based sort of narrative around rural communities. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. We need to move beyond the support. We need to even move beyond leveraging toward really how are we going to enable and unleash rural communities to, to drive the success of this country. And so um, I hope we'll get into all of that and more in the conversation today. <laughs> But I'll leave it there, Matt. Uh, thank you so much, Carol. I think we'll we'll get into a lot of it. Um, I, I can't promise we'll get into all of it. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I'm, I'm just following the chat function, and there's just a lot of you know support for the investment mindset. Not thinking of rural communities as a cost center. Uh, that um, uh, from from Kathy and um, uh, Jeanette uh, also that. Uh, a one size fits all approach is not going to work. And even when you said rural solutions for rural communities, there's also, as you know, uh, better than I, uh, a wide diversity of rural communities, each with its own unique uh, challenges and opportunities and assets. Um, and um, uh, so one of the things I want to uh, ask you more about Carol, because um, you've just been raising it and you don't, you don't have to go into it if, uh, if you don't want, and if you want to say, just read the paper that you put out uh, two weeks ago, but the, um, the, the, some of the questions you, the specific issues you raised uh, around tax tools and revenue tools and fiscal tools um, around governance and rural um, uh uh, rural participants at decision-making tables and having autonomy and decision-making authority and agency. Um, uh, do you have um, anything, uh, I know it's in the paper, but that you wanted to raise at this point about specific uh, things that you think would be really helpful for uh, federal or provincial governments to be moving forward with on in kind of the next three to six months? Sure, yeah, I, I appreciate the question, you know, and I'll, I'll take a quick second to expand on what I was raising earlier, which is really sort of how quickly we learned how vulnerable we are across the country. And that was true for the big cities, and it's certainly true for, for the, the spectrum of rural communities as well. You know, I'll tell you, again, very quickly, the, the sort of rising public safety costs and communities doing what they need to do to keep their, their citizens safe collided with the plummeting user fee revenues, plummeting revenues really right across the board from everything from, you know, parks and recreation and so on and so forth. And, and again, forced very quickly to the brink of financial crisis. I mean, that, that simply is not tenable for, for a country like Canada. 
Um, and it took a real collaborative effort across orders of government to secure and implement uh, emergency funding through the Safe Restart Agreements to protect those kinds of frontline services Canadians need. You know, and it's not hyperbolic here. I was, you know, as we were all sort of in the early weeks of the pandemic, still trying to uh, figure out what exactly was happening. And, and many rural leaders doing this in a volunteer capacity in their communities, they're also having quick conversations of, boy, are we going to need to amalgamate? Oh, my gosh, what services are we going to need to cut? What's what's core? What, what can we possibly do without at a time when Canadians most needed all of those things? Um, and so there was a real need um, to pull together a conversation um, in, and blow through some of the jurisdictional um, barriers that often, you know, really uh, create a lot of the inertia around many of these conversations. Um, and it was an example of when orders of government pulled together and came together and said, all right, you know, we, we need to get out of our own way here and figure out how are we going to create a solution to what is right now a national emergency. And so, you know, that is a mentality that I, I hope lives on beyond the pandemic. We proved it in multiple sort of policy, ambitious policy solutions throughout the course of the pandemic because we were forced to work together in, in that kind of way and to move past those kinds of um, more traditional uh, jurisdictional boundaries in terms of how we engage, what tables are convened and so forth. And we just we just had to work together and got it done. And I think that's the kind of takeaway you got to hold lives on in the context that behooves us to learn those lessons from this kind of a challenge. More immediately, I think what we saw very quickly was that the more direct, the more predictable um, the funding tool uh, for local government, including rural communities, the better, the more, the easier it was going to be to move fast and to, to build the projects, put in the measures that communities needed to put in place um, at the pace in which they needed to respond to this pandemic. And so, you know, tools like right now, the Canada Community building fund, which is the rebranded gas tax fund, um, where there is a very, you know, very direct, very predictable um, to local government funding tool that really enables them to meet meet their needs, identify their own needs and apply them accordingly um, is really the, the sort of best mechanism for, for, fi- for funding local government. And so, you know, looking at what works and scaling that way. And then and then by, by issue where we've got funding programs designed, again, to the point of the necessity of, you know, meaningful engagement of rural leaders around that table, how do we apply a rural lens to that, to that um, specific fund? And so, Name disaster mitigation adaptation, that's a good one um, to focus in on, making sure that that's accessible to rural communities in a real way, again, on a principle of sort of as direct, as predictable as possible, um, if it's really going to be implementable fast uh, and effectively on the ground. Um, and I'll just, you know, I'm going to be a broken record on it, but I'll, I'll highlight none of like you, the necessity of, of really um, the universal broadband fund being able to be implemented quickly to stimulate our economies to create those jobs um, also from an inclusion and resilience perspective in the long term can't be understated. So that feels like a first order of business for, for governments collectively. Uh, that's uh, that's really helpful, Carol. Thank you. And connectivity, broadband fund, uh, uh, predictable funding um, and decision making power like those three things are things that have come up in a lot of uh, the conversation so far as as key enablers um, and and key priorities. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, your introduction, Carol, and the focus on place and community, because certainly in a lot of the work that I've been reading over the last kind of five years, there's this reemergence of focus on community and place. Um, some of you have, you know, foreshadowed that, uh, focusing on it uh, years before it became fashionable. Um, uh, but uh, I'd like to kind of go back to 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 Kathleen now um, and and kind of ask about that and ask about uh, you know the the importance of place the importance of community and you had spoken about leveraging rural assets and the strength in place um, what uh, and we can come back in a minute to talking about like the rural ends and what that means for decision making um, but what do you think that means Kathleen um, in kind of practical terms for federal or provincial or territorial governments um, and you know how how do, how would that uh, translate into reshaping their approach or uh, you know how they how they deal with uh, issues if they are, you know, trying to leverage rural assets and uh, really investing in the strength of place? Yeah, these are all so pivotal. All of these questions, we could spend the day just having great discourse here. 
Carol's remarks particularly were really um, insightful there. So I would see real opportunity in three critical areas that um, all levels of government, but particularly the federal government, could be taking some leadership on. When we look at the strengths of rural communities, thinking about circular economy, that's an area we haven't touched on yet today, but it is something Canada is lagging behind. And there is no away. Some people say we're going to just throw that away. Well, there is no away on the planet. And often the away becomes rural. Um, and communities that um, are taking up other people's waste, <clears throat> there's many ways that other countries are harvesting potential there and channeling those to full life cycle pr production. That's certainly a uh, priority. And there's a lot of great initiatives. Just this week, uh, Turning Point came out, a federal report on the necessity for circular economies. So there's real good literature that's growing, uh, similar to uh, Sean's work all these decades on uh, play space, and now people are catching up to that. Um, and I think we really need to catch up to circular economy. So utilizing the natural assets, and as Ashley Wisely says, it's not just harvesting for touristic benefit, it's really um, honoring and respecting the resources and protecting those as well. Um, Canada cannot progress. I love that, that if rural communities are not well and, and prosperous, nor can Canada be, nor can we do well if um, children are living in poverty. So Canada is way behind on its standards for treating children, um, both um, Indigenous communities, but uh, Canada overall is, I think, 17 out of 29 countries where we could be far more leaders in um, investing much more sensibly. So it, it makes good policy sense to invest in basic income. It's money that would be well spent because we're currently investing it in other ways in the system, and it's just not amounting to humane, decent, and prosperous outcomes. So what is it we co-desire? What is it that communities want to co-create? Uh, they know that, and that needs to be designed and co-developed at the local level um, with partnership. So it is a government, it is a, a industry, as well as citizen um, kind of dialogue that needs to be happening everywhere. So around basic income, there's a lot of uh, great literature. Again, great work is happening here. <clears throat> so how can we um, take advantage of the people um, in communities, their knowledge, their talents, their passions, and devising um, a national program, but that also leads to, as was seen with municipal governments, um, some real creative ways to manage around a crisis. And then lastly, we cannot uh, not notice that we have a zoonotic disease that has disrupted our lives and um, more disruption is anticipated if climate crisis is not better managed and we can anticipate possibly more zoonotic diseases, which I certainly hope we do not, but other types of calamities that have to do with our food system, pests and other areas of affecting yield. So governments at all levels need to be far more proactive on um, shoring up and creatively designing with citizens at local levels, delicious succulent food systems that are built on sustainability principles that are built on indigenous ways of knowing and that foster greater security and um, sufficiency. So yeah, safety is at the center. Then we need food security, then food sovereignty or sufficiency, all um, wrapped around with a nice bow of sustainability. So I think all of those are critical concerns and um, I would build on the good work of all of the other uh, speakers here, but I think Canada has great potential that we need to uh, show much more leadership. Thank, thank you so much, Kathleen. I wanna pick up on a couple of those themes and I'm gonna go to, uh, to Ashley um, and then to Sean. And I don't mean to show my uh, interests or biases here, but I'm very interested in some of the governance discussions uh, that have uh, come forward. And I'm very, as some people know, interested in the governance and how uh, we actually translate policy and program into actionable solutions on the ground. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about co-creation. Um, and co-decision making. Um, and uh, uh, Ashley and Sean, um, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to, to talk about how you think that can work in ways that work for, for smaller communities. Um, but I did want to just, uh, you know, pick up a bit on uh, uh, Carol's point 
uh, as well uh, about just kind of getting things done during the pandemic. And that may have been, you know, your experience, Carol, with uh, municipalities, but certainly across the board, federal government, between departments and ministries and provincial governments, people just broke down processes and rules to get uh, I was, I was going to swear on TV. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, to get stuff done. Um, and it's important to get stuff done. And people were willing to break down rules and processes. And the system, as uh, you know, most of us know, there's an entropy and that a lot of these things will return um, uh, once uh, an immediate crisis is passed. So I'm really interested in people you know, thinking about how you know, we can take the best of a crisis approach um, and make those kinds of process decisions, um, changes to get things done more quickly, more easily, more collaboration across ministries, but across governments and integrate municipal governments uh, and municipal leaders in that, in that decision-making. So, um, uh, Ashley, in the context of uh, your comments on right to be rural, um, uh, where do you think we move on this in terms of local decision making, co-creation, autonomy? Um, how can we actually make this work on the ground? Yeah, so I think I think it starts with the premise of what is government for, right? What is the public sector for? And um, I, I really, I, I personally, and the communities I work in and around, never want to be called resilient ever again in my life. Because what calling rural places and people resilient does is it lets us off the hook and us, I say, like, we are the public sector. I work in a publicly funded university. I've worked for government. It's not some abstract ideal. It's people doing things. So we have to move away from this idea that the, the government is something uh, out there and not us personally doing things between individual peoples and actors. Um, but what we do when we say resiliency, when we rely, oh, we're so resilient, is it lets us off the hook for doing the actual work of preventing the need to be resilient in the first place. So what we've seen in particular, whether it's the pandemic, and I, I could not agree with Carol Moore on the broadband thing. We've had broadband policy statements in this country since at least the mid-1980s, so as long as I've been alive, and we have not moved the needle at all, because we don't actually look at what did we do? Do we know that we did anything? How will we know that anybody is any better off? And we just keep throwing money at a broken system. So in order to shift that, and I, there's a great piece by um, uh, Alex Hemingway from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives that just came out today talking about when we talk about fiscal or governance uh, responsibility or accountability, we often think of it as cutting things or reducing public sector actors or sort of devolving those things to the private sector. And instead of looking at the fact that actual public sector accountability, fiscal responsibility means investing in the things we need to invest in. And I'm going to just point to a study that um, my advisor, Ryan Gibson, and myself and Sean and a few others have been working on, on rural infrastructure and economic development. The responses that we heard from a survey of over 250 local leaders was, I would rather have zero funding on a year after year basis if that's what it would take for it to be sustainable and stable, rather than relying on lotteries or competitive grants or these kinds of things where we ask municipalities to kind of go toe to toe with each other to get the money that's supposed to flow to them anyway. So I think when we start thinking about the governance cycle is we need to a little bit stop patting ourselves on the back for doing the job of spending the money on infrastructure that we're supposed to be doing and look at how that flows. So um, we need to rearrange that arrangement to look at this, that just like we're all kind of thinking of ourselves as a single single person, you know, we pay into the system, we participate in the system, then we have multiple levels of government. Well, what happens if we look at this as one public sector all working towards a common good, rather than the federal, the provincial, and local governments actually often working against each other to achieve the same goal? So this comes down to how we frame funding programs. Is it about making municipalities compete against each other for the money that they need in order to invest in the infrastructure that's critical to preventing things like the great disaster of flooding we've seen in the Sumas Prairie in BC. What would happen if we viewed those things as the necessary care and maintenance of doing government right, no matter what your level of government was? So we need to appropriately scale where resources go and where decisions are made in order to make sure that we're putting those investments in place. I think we often forget that the role of government, which is different than governance, is to 
tax and spend, right? Like we need to collect the money and spend it outward on the projects that need doing. So instead of framing that as a bad thing, let's look at how we manage that. The governance of saying who gets a say over how that flows, how those resources flow, and how do we appropriately scale that? So I think that the work that FCM has been doing, certainly the work that here in Ontario, that Roma and AMO do, the work that a lot of our caucuses uh, through the Ontario Good Roads Association and stuff have been advocating for a number of years. Those solutions are already being proposed and they're out there. We just need to listen to them and do them. And so jam a a stick in the transformative policy window, right? We saw how (laughs) fast and nimble we could be during this pandemic. What's the excuse for not being that way on a go forward basis? There isn't one. So I think we need to commit to looking at that in terms of how do we do the thing we know we need to do rather than creating excuses for not doing it. Uh, thank you, Ashley. I'm watching the chat. If people have specific questions that they would like to pose, now is a, is a great time uh, to do that. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to turn it over to Sean and give him a chance to speak to that same question. Because, Sean, you were speaking about, uh, you know, a return to investment mentality. And I'm just very interested in what what that means in practice, um, in, in um, uh, you know, plain language, what it means for communities to return to an investment mentality. And, you know, we've heard a lot about from, from both Ashley and, and Carol, actually, uh, about the importance of, like, I'll say core funding, but Carol said predictable funding, the, the, the rebranded gas tax um, uh, fund. And Ashley talked about competitive grants for infrastructure projects rather than core funding for uh, infrastructure projects. And it creates a bunch of churn and process. And there is nominally a reason for it in terms of accountability and those kinds of things. But there's also a good argument to be made to you know, devolve resources and let local people, whether that's in cities or mid-sized cities or small cities or rural communities uh, or small towns make decisions uh, for themselves about how to invest um, their public dollar. Um, so those are all uh, you know, important themes that, that we can uh, pick up on. And, um, but, but just turning it over to Sean on that question of uh, local communities and having an investment mentality, what that means to you in practice. Sure. Well, I mean, for communities, uh, it means a repair to roads that are crumbling because they're not capable of handling the industrial infrastructure of the 21st century. It means that the curling rink that you have that's being held together by duct tape uh, might actually have a future. Uh, It means um, uh, decent transportation uh, sources and linkages to urban centers to revitalize transportation routes for goods and services. So the the implications of returning to investment mentality are very, very real and and addressing the infrastructure gaps that the, you know, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has done such an excellent job over the last sort of five or 10 years of highlighting. Uh, I I mentioned sort of going back 30 or 40 years of uh, trying to undo some of the, some of the damage of uh, a bit more of a neoliberal approach to governance. Um, But communities themselves are not interested in going back to the governance relationships of 30 or 40 years. Right. We've learned just so much about uh, how the, the, you know, the terminologies that you're you're using here in terms of co-creation and uh, co-construction of policy. Uh, Local governments, community associations, they have stepped into that void that's been left behind through the withdrawal of government services. And having experienced that power, having experienced the potential of, of sort of meshing their own understanding of their communities, their knowledge of place with the potential for reinvestment, that's a power they're not willing to give up, uh, nor should they. So that, you know, that in and of itself is really the power of a place-based approach, which is, can be very challenging for, um, for senior governments, uh, because they are dealing with more blunt instruments of policy and the diversity of rural conditions, uh, can be very challenging. Uh, but that's where this, this knowledge of place, this appreciation of diversity, uh, really comes to fore because communities are stepping into that, that power vacuum, uh, what they need are the resources and the, you know, as Ashley was sort of talking about sort of a consistent ongoing recognition of, uh, not only needing to repair some of the damages that have been done by not reinvesting, but moving forward in terms of 
both the uh, addressing the vagaries of climate change and a very different sort of global economy and economic system. So the the emphasis is also on the local governments, local communities themselves to get organized, have their own plans, show up to these conversations with senior governments and telling people what they would like rather than being sort of passive recipients of, of government funding. Uh, we've seen, I think, a bit more of a uh, of a piecemeal approach, right? My uh, colleague Greg Halseth and Laura Reiser and, and others have sort of framed this as moving into a period of policy incoherence, where we understand that uh, the lack of investment over the last 30 or 40 years has created severe externalities on communities. The, the curling rinks, the degraded cultural institutions, the uh, limited transportation options, uh, but that so we recognize those challenges, but we haven't quite figured out what that next phase is going to look like. Uh, and for rural communities and local governments, it means uh, having your uh, plans in order, yeah, being prepared for a very different future uh, and being willing to come to the table and work with senior governments, but have um, you know really good information at your disposal, very sophisticated information at your disposal about who you are and where you would like to go in the future. Uh, and that in and of itself can actually make the role of senior governments much, much easier. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that, Sean. I know we're we're close to uh, to time. This has gone more quickly than uh, I would have liked. Um, uh, you know, there there are lots of questions on the chat that we may uh, get back to over uh, over the next uh, couple of hours. Um, uh, Mike Toy is talking about um, you know governance and decentralized decision making. Uh, and community futures being an example of that and some practical success stories. And we have people from community futures on, on later. So uh, we can uh, get into that. What I'm, what I'm taking away from this, the, the last part of, of this discussion is the importance of devolution, the importance of resources, the importance of, of co-creation. Uh, I hadn't thought of it the way you had thought of it. Sean, and the way you've just articulated in terms of uh, municipal governments and local leaders taking the place of absent, um, uh, of absent uh, other uh, processes. And so now how, uh, if provincial and federal governments want to be re-engaged re in place, how do you um, collaborate and uh, work together on that? So uh, we have, um, I think, like, two minutes. Um, so I'm not going to ask another question, but I will do a quick round table. Uh, um, again, we will uh, re-engage over the next several months as we as we do our work um, with all of you. But I wanted to give everyone you know, a final moment uh, if they wanted to pick up on anything that I've raised from the chat or you know, a final thought. Um, and I'll, I'll go to Kathleen, then uh, Ashley, then Sean, then uh, Carol. Uh, if you had a, a final message that you thought was important for people to hear. Yeah, rich is what I say. This um, anyone on this call is so fortunate to listen to these great minds here. Um, I would just um, draw people's attention to the upcoming sessions that uh, you have scheduled, um, and particularly looking at um, systems thinking and well-being writ large. So the social determinants of health, funny enough, are very much in alignment with the Canadian Index of Well-Being, and we ought to invest wisely in all of them. Thank you, Kathleen. Ashley? Yeah, I just would want to point people to the 2021 State of Rural Canada report that has been edited by Kyle Rich, Heather Hall, Grace Nelson, that has just recently come out. It's available at www.surf.ca. Um, it's an incredible read that will help inform a lot of great storytelling about how we move forward. And then I'd end with the two questions that I always encourage people to ask, which is when you're viewing any of these recommendations about rural futures is to ask, who is it for? And then, so what? Um, in terms of how will we know that anyone is better off and how will we actually achieve the visions that we've put forward and make sure that they're in the service of the people we claim they are in the service of. So this has been exciting and wonderful. Um, and I always love getting to hang out with all of you folks. So thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. And I do strong endorse to uh, both the, the uh, reference from Kathleen and, uh, and the resources from, uh, from Ashley. Uh, Sean. 
Yeah, and just to reiterate my thanks to to the rest of the panel uh, for um, being invited uh, to this to this discussion. Uh, I, I you know I would like to sort of pick up on one of the themes that I talked about in my introductory comments, which is that it's 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 wonderful to be having these conversations. Uh, Ashley, I'd, I'd like it to be maybe a little bit more of a robust instrument than a stick holding open that policy window, uh, but that's a good place to start. Uh, and um, you know a, a a return to to engaging. Um, a discourse around rural development, uh, around the future of rural Canada, uh, drawing upon the the wonderful research um, and and uh, citizen advocacy that exists across uh, this country is a is a wonderful uh, way to move forward, and it's it's great to see uh, that be sort of reengaged uh, after a number of years. I think where um, uh, we were uh, two solitudes in terms of moving forward. So thanks very much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I, uh, again, strong endorse that, that final point. Um, Carol. Thanks, Matthew. Yes, I'll also uh, add my endorsement for the resources that have been named and, and also suggest you read the, the Partners for Canada's Recovery at fcm.ca as well for some very sort of specific tangible pathways um, to a lot of what we discussed today. You know, I'll use my last minute to really highlight, I think I really also appreciated, Sean, your articulation of that frame in terms of local government and community actors taking up that space. And Matt, your question about how government uh, can now re-engage it, senior orders of government can now re-engage it. We know how to do this is what I would <laughs> what I would leave with this group. We've seen that we can do it in the past 20 months. And there are some, you know, small examples um, or bigger examples in unique circumstances where we've been able to um, really uh, move past the inertia that exists around some of the interjurisdictional challenges um, to, to get stuff done. And so uh, I, I agree with Ashley that we need to do that. And I think um, to your question of how can senior orders do it, well, it's it's now engaging the those who have taken up that space. And so further empowering um, local governments to be able and, and engaging them meaningfully in the foundational conversations is, is how to do it. It's not um, new, it's not revolutionary, but in our context, it sure would be. So. I'll leave that, leave that as the closing thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. And strong endorse on your report. Too. I'm just endorsing. Um, you'll think I endorse easily, but I don't usually. Um, so thank you to all four of you. Uh, thank you for making yourselves uh, available digitally in uh, in uh, the uh, the situation we're in. I'm just following the, the chat here and lots of interesting uh, references to work and conferences uh, and um, some governance ideas. So we'll be capturing all all of this. Uh, so thank you very much, Kathleen, Ashley, Sean, and Carol for taking the time to, to kick this off. Uh, we're going to take, uh, we're about three minutes, behind, four minutes behind schedule, but that's fine because we'll probably pick up some time later. Uh, we're going to take an 11 minute break now. Um, and at 2.30, we'll be back uh, with uh, the panel on community wealth and well-being and, and quality of life. Um, so people can get some tea or uh, use, the, use the facilities. But thank you to all four of you. And we will continue this conversation later this afternoon and over the next few months. Thanks very much. Hello, good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Van Weimaren, and I'm the Director of Research and Policy at Springboard Policy. I am coming to you live from Pemberton, BC, territory of Wilwat Nation. I'm very excited to be here to, this afternoon to moderate this discussion on how we can improve community well being and quality of life in rural and small communities. I'm going to start off this panel by introducing our speakers and doing a bit, quick bit of housekeeping. First off, don't be shy to share your questions and comments through the discussion chat in the chat. Zoom can be sort of a funny medium, but I'll be watching the chat as we talk and I'll try to, if, if possible, I'll try to work in your questions on the fly. Uh, we're gonna start off the panel with a high level question for each panelist. And then after that, we're just going to try to let the conversation flow. I'll throw in some follow-up questions to the extent that these four very quiet people uh, run out of things to say. Um, so, and then in the last 15 or 20 minutes of the panel, we're going to open it up further to your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First up, we have Zita Cobb, founder and CEO at Shorefast. Zita Cobb is the founder uh, of Shorefast, a registered charity that operates charitable programs and social businesses in service of the local community on Fo Fogo Island. Through her work, Zita is an advocate for the value of place and a way of life that is equitable, dignified, and sustainable. Thanks for joining us, Zita. 
Second up, we have Danny Graham, Chief Engagement Officer at Engage Nova Scotia, uh, where he is working on a, the Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative. Danny was the founder of the Nova Scotia Restorative Justice Program, has, was formerly the Chief Negotiator for the Nova Scotia Government on Aboriginal Rights, and has acted as an advisor to the United Nations Development Program on Justice Reform. Welcome, Danny. Uh, next up, we have Patty Hughes, CEO of Prince Albert Chamber of Commerce and past chair at Community Fut Futures Network of Canada. Patty has a diverse background in business strategy, economic development, marketing, and government relations. Throughout her career, she has worked on the issue of economic development through, while wearing many different hats, board member, government relations expert, business development manager, and proud volunteer. Uh, she comes to us today as CEO of Prince Albert Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned, and the past chair of Community Futures Network, where she just ended her term last month. Last but certainly not least, we have Nancy Broadbent. Uh, Nancy is the president and CEO of Portage College. She's worked for over 30 years in various senior in various senior leadership roles at the college, both on the academic and the services side before her current role. As a mother and grandmother, Nancy values creating personal and professional connections. She looks for opportunities to create collaborative approaches for the college and communities in the, in the region, uh, which is on Treaty 6 homelands of First Nation and Métis people. Thank you for all joining us. So let's just get into it. Um, the high level question for this panel is how do we support economic activity that improves quality of life and well being in smaller communities? We touched on a few of the various themes of that in the first panel, uh, but I think we have a rich opportunity here to dig into the meat of it a little bit more. Uh, how the panel is going to go first off, we'll start with Zita. One of the things I've heard you speak about before is the importance of place for our shared economic future. If we're truly going to put place at the center of our world policy strategies, what kind of changes does that push policymakers to consider? Jamie, I think we should be putting place at the center of all of our strategies, not just our rural strategies. I think there is, uh, let's talk about place for a minute. There's nothing more foundational than place. It's our most foundational relationship. Place holds nature and culture. And each and every one of us, no matter how um, digitally um, equipped we are, we have to put our heads down somewhere every night and that's in a place. And so I think it's the basic building block. And I think community, whether we're talking rural or urban or something in between, is the basic unit of change. And so the question is, what are we optimizing for when we think about our economy? And I think we can get to a place where the economy is the sum of all the community economies, as opposed to the reality we have now that Often the economy seems to be doing just fine and community economies are being hollowed out every day. So we, we need to turn that around and say, what are we optimizing for? So from a policy point of view, if every, I think in, I, I, I've never worked in government, but I think the word lens is used a lot. Uh, and so if the lens we put on every piece of policy, not just rural economic development policy, but if we put a lens of place, 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 where people live, I think that'll get slightly different outcomes because at the moment, we are subpar optimizing. And I will give you this little example because I think it says so much. Fogo Island is an island and islands are sort of natural laboratories. And in some government department uh, somewhere, someone decided that the best way to get somebody off of Fogo Island if they're sick and they need you know, serious medical attention is to commandeer the ferry and to put them on the ferry because that must be cheaper, I guess, is why that decision was made. While the ferry is being commandeered to take this person who now has a two-hour trip to Gander, uh, we have people sitting in the lineup that are people who live on the island who are going for medical appointments or going to catch flights. We have people sitting in cars trying to catch international flights because we have a tourism economy. And we have all kinds of fish sitting in trucks that's going bad because it can't get to market. So that's a perfect example of subpar optimization. So we have policies that don't consider the lens of community economy in deciding how people should leave the island if they need medical attention. So I, I think it's not a big shift, it's just a total mind shift that's not a big space. Like the difference between seeing something and not seeing something is like that. Thank you for that. Uh, Danny, policymakers often talk about the need to go beyond GDP in terms of measuring economic well-being through your work what does it look like on the ground to measure quality of life? Uh, thanks very much, Jamie. Uh, thanks uh, to my fellow panelists for 
Uh, joining in this discussion and those people who are online, I'm coming to you from Chibuktuk, uh, Halifax, in the territory of Mi'kma'ki, uh, the traditional land of the people uh, from the Mi'kmaq people, people of the Dawn. Um, this is, uh, I work with uh, a nonprofit called Engage Nova Scotia, and uh, we look at the systemic issues across the uh, public, private, academic, and community sectors. And um, we uh, came to be in part because we were of the view that the solutions that are most complex in societies, increasingly governments were having challenges uh, getting to. And so they needed partners who were looking to a longer, deeper game about what holds us back and what our full potential is. So uh, this for us as an organization led us into uh, rich questions about what a successful society looks like. Uh, we've been asking this question for a long period of time. And uh, perhaps uh, if you could put up slides, I've got three slides that illustrate what we're doing in this uh, vein here in uh, Nova Scotia. So um, when we were musing about what a successful society looks like uh, back in 2015, we asked two questions of Nova Scotians. On a scale of one to 10, we should measure our success by answer one, growing the economy, answer two, improving our quality of life. And when we uh, looked at those people who answered in Nova Scotia, seven, eight, nine, or 10 on that uh, scale, you can see quite clearly that uh, back in 2015, and more recently measured again uh, since the pandemic, this notion of quality of life really stands out for uh, the people of our province. And as we've thought about what that really means, uh, there, there's a lot of complexity inside of it. Some of it very directly relates to, I think, uh, some of what Zita was uh, pointing to. And it's not at all to diminish the importance of a dynamic economy. But in this coastal province, it's been our experience that rising tides of economic growth don't always lead to uh, people's well-being. And uh, that's been known for some period of time. So uh, the questions that we're hoping we will be able to ask is, uh, as we look to move beyond GDP, as we look to uh, create a dynamic uh, economy, it's about economic development in service of what and who and where. Um, and that um, when we provided this uh, slide to Nova Scotians, um, we were surprised that it gave us, first of all, a license to be able to talk about it. But some of the most enthusiastic of our partners were people in the private sector and who are involved in economic development because they see that economic development and quality of life are really two sides of the same coin and they feed off each other. So uh, to next slide, please. We undertook a deeper dive into this question uh, in 2019 when we uh, circulated a 230 question survey, uh, a quality of life survey, asking Nova Scotians to answer uh, uh, many of the questions that really are driving their quality of life. And it includes, of course, many questions related to the economy. Um, and when we uh, wanted to get a strong response, you'll see we almost had 13,000 responses to this. It gave us the opportunity to look at the stories of people in their regions of the province and not just chunked up by two or three regions of the province as a whole. So this for local leaders meant that for the first time, they're able to actually understand those stories at a depth that they hadn't been able to before. And the kinds of questions that they're being able to ask and answer for themselves are pretty vast. Uh, next slide, please. It includes um, the dimensions that are shown. This was done in collaboration with the Canadian Index of Wellbeing. And uh, we can slice, cut, and dice so much of the understanding related to that. We're currently, and on our website at engagenovascotia.ca, we've got uh, tons of uh, analysis that relate to the answers that Nova Scotians have given us to that. Uh, some of it relates to the topics that show up in the paper that was shared in advance of this paper about the quality of internet, the experiences of newcomers uh, to our community, people's experience in um, in creating uh, satisfying jobs and being able to access uh, upgrades in their education. So lots more to do as we uh, look to explore 
uh, these questions. There are a lot of promising things, certainly for people in non-urban environments where uh, consistently in our uh, study, but this is a trend that exists across Canada and internationally, and that is that uh, satisfaction with life for people in non-urban uh, communities on average consistently is uh, quite strong and stronger than it is in urban situations. That doesn't, I don't want to set it up as a dichotomy at all, but it certainly points us to advantages that we haven't quite seen before and I think can be better understood as we try to knit together stronger communities wherever you live, urban or non-urban. Thanks, Danny. Uh, Patty, through your work, Community Futures has been on the front lines of economic development work for over 30 years. What kinds of changes would you like to see to be able to strengthen the ability of communities to shape their well-being? Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you for this opportunity today. I'm uh, honored to be part of this discussion uh, with the, my fellow colleagues here on behalf of Community Futures. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge I come from the Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground, a gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, so to Black, Foot, Métis, Diné, and Nakota Sioux. Uh, to answer their questions, there's a few points that I'd like to make. Um, I've been a champion for the CF program and have volunteered with it for 14 years and committed to supporting entrepreneurs, small and medium enterprises, and rural economic development. Community Futures has had a significant history and proven um, to deliver community economic development. So what would it take for Community Futures to continue to be that champion and be the delivery agent in rural and remote uh, Canada? It means maintaining local direction over the delivery of federal funds. The history of the CF program shows that local governance leads to better decisions that lead to greater impact. Community leaders in LaRange, Saskatchewan understand better than decision makers in Ottawa where funding is best directed in their community. This allows opportunity for the program to be successful and sustainable. The funding needs to be flexible and accountable to meet the unique needs of the community for sustainable economic development. Another one is increased access to capital for rural and northern entrepreneurs. The allowable maximum loans that currently Community Futures organizations in Western Canada have not increased in 20 years but the capital needs for our clients have continued to increase with inflation. $150,000 20 years ago is not the same as it is today. Couple that with increasing restrictive lending practices by the big five banks and small businesses are finding it harder to get the capital that they need. This will be particularly limiting to the recovery of COVID-19. And, and looking forward, we're, we're actually I'm taking a look at that right now as an organization and, and what it means. So. As well, um, recognizing the potential in a delivery network that offers 267 points of service, including 33 AFIs, that's Aboriginal financial institutions, in rural and remote communities across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. Community Futures has had a long history of delivering federal programming quickly, effectively and efficiently, and could be utilized to do much more. Uh, recently, we've had some opportunities with some project funding, such as the Rural Opportunity Funds and the Churchill Regional Economic Development Fund. And as well, in regards to COVID, we were the delivery agent for the Regional uh, Relief and Recovery Fund, Triple RF. These were prime examples of how community futures can deliver community economic development and be the deliver sustainable economic development and be effective at it. Um, another is effectively and equitably funding the Community Futures Network. We have had frozen operational funding since 2010, and we have, it has significantly impacted our ability to serve our communities. Simply helping us catch up on the funding that, we'll, that we've lost will allow our funding, or our, sorry, allow our staff to shift more of their focus from keeping the doors open to helping rural Canada recover from its recent COVID and environmental challenges. And it continued to adapt to our local economies to the changing economic realities. As well, another one that we'd like to acknowledge is the digital infrastructure. It's strengthening that and increasing the bandwidth needed in rural and remote areas. It's difficult for small and medium enterprises to compete and grow when they don't have the service they need as well as the reliability. As well, access to online training and education for the rural remote areas would increase opportunities and help do community economic development. Thanks, Patty. And Nancy, uh, 
what role do you think that anchor institutions such as, you know, educational institutions like Portage College can play in promoting uh, community well-being? Thank you. I'm very honored to be here today. And uh, my I'd like to be scribbling lots of notes to learn from the panelists. So I'll have to use my memory today. Uh, I, I am joining you, as was mentioned in my bio, from uh, Treaty 6 from Lac La Biche County in northeastern Alberta, which uh, is homelands to many First Nation and Métis peoples. Um, I want to give you a quick background on portages, who portages, just so that you have an understanding of my perspective. So portage uh, was founded in 1968. We were a federal government research organization called Alberta New Start. Uh, we didn't actually deliver any training at the time. We were researching what was the best way to train uh, indigenous people in the region. So our region has seven First Nations and four Métis settlements. Um, and in 1970, the government shut down Alberta News Start and uh, it created quite a chaos in our community. And a number of First Nation and Métis leaders in the community actually staged a 26-day sit-in and said, we need this uh, institution and went to Ottawa and made sure that the institution was still standing. Uh, we were uh, reopened under the name that was granted from those foundational leaders of Pitapan, meaning New Dawn. And I think it's important for folks to understand that's where I'm coming from because uh, mostly what I'm going to talk to you about is engagement of people. People are certainly the strength in a community. And yes, we definitely need resources to support the programs. Um, but I, I do subscribe to a concept that, you know, we are one drop, but together we're an ocean. And I know that's a funny thing to say from landlocked northeastern Alberta, but I'll give you a bit of an analogy that, you know, we do have a lot of lakes in northeastern Alberta and every one of those lakes is very unique to its own ecosystem and to the animals, the, you know, flora and fauna that are in the area. And I see communities the same way. Each community has its own culture, its own history. It has a, a way of being, and that's formed by the people that are in it. And I, you know, I, I'm very interested to have more conversation with Zita because I think my concepts are very similar to what she calls plant place based decisions. I, we really believe in working with people. And as an anchor institution with those communities, I think it's our role to listen and get a vibe of what's going on in the communities to connect people. Because I find in rural Alberta, it's very obvious there are numerous government agencies, community futures, REDAs, everyone that's very concerned about economic development. And I tend to be the one at the college that says, oh, well, why don't we get all of you guys together in some sort of a forum and bring the leaders from the community so that they can help understand who can help with what? Um, because I do find there is some confusion out there. Um, and I and you know, I think just a couple of stories that I'll tell uh, about how the college works to give you a bit of flavor. So I believe as an educational institution, not only do we have subject matter experts that you know, the community calls upon and, and we can create thought and we can create ideas with those people that have passion to be able to pursue whatever opportunities are out there. But we also have students that go out into the communities and do projects that are very impactful on the wellness of the community. So I'll talk about community social work program as an example. Those, that program has 840 hours of placement, so that's one thing. And on top of that, they also have projects that they do in the community, and that can be anything from grant writing for a local charity. It can be fundraising for agencies or organizations, or it could be raising awareness of a key issue like homelessness. For example, we had a group of social work students that camped out at 40 below to show uh, our community what homelessness is all about. So, you know, I think uh, this whole idea about place-based decisions, I totally subscribe to. I believe local people can solve local problems. It doesn't mean that they don't need an agency of support around them and they need to understand what each of those groups can do for them. And the policy obviously drives a lot of the agency work, just like it does for Portage. 
But I think in the end, um, if the solution comes from local people and you get that richness of them collaborating to create the solution, it's far more sustainable in the long run and it gets better buy-in than sometimes, uh, you know, an idea that comes from a, a big planning session and, and sort of a thought of perhaps a smaller group of people. So, yeah, so, you know, that is that is one example. And then we have other examples where, particularly in the First Nations and Métis communities, we're invited by industry to go out and do something that's completely what the community wants and building capacity within those people. Um, and it's really that connection and working together that I believe is a really big difference in in the sustainability and and the ongoing and I and I really want to respond to uh, quality of life, but when we get into the back and forth, I'd like to I'd like to have some conversation about that. So thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you. I mean, why don't we jump into the conversation about quality of life then, Nancy? Sure. So so I I totally agree with you, and I think that one thing that has become extremely obvious in our communities is um, this concept of work there, live here. And not that I want all the jobs to not be in the smaller communities, but I, I do believe that um, many people come to rural Alberta to work at our college because they know that after work, they can be in their car and they can be out on the lake, paddling around, fishing, whatever it is within 20 minutes. <laughs> so that quality of life uh, that, you know, in past years we might have talked a lot about is there a big box store or that kind of thing that stuff kind of became a little less important as we moved through COVID because of course we were all about not traveling and staying home but you know it's it's where it puts pressure on things like bandwidth particularly and you know obviously my business is all about to the home and uh, and was particularly with COVID but I, I do really think about that. And I, I wonder sometimes with some of the challenges of urban migration and, and the health issues that it creates, particularly for people of lower income, whether there isn't something we can do to balance things out. Do any of you have a response to that? Maybe since I popped into the quality of life question so prominently, I'll uh, support uh, that as a concept, I, I think Nancy, you're onto something. And from a Nova Scotia perspective, uh, the, our historical story has been one of, and Zita would be able to re, uh, relate to this. Uh, I grew up in Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, where you raised your kids to move away, and that's uh, had a significant economic. Um, uh, has had significant implications for us in terms of creating the kind of dynamism and innovation in the economy that we need in local communities and that sort of thing. The trend related to that is actually going now back in the other direction. And um, it's not without its complexities in terms of making sure that uh, communities are ready for people and that the conversations are ones that foster that sense of belonging that is required. But um we are now experiencing an influx of people. Our sense is that the pandemic is incubating uh, the kinds of questions that have been in the background for a long period of time about what matters most and who's being left behind. And on the what matters most question, um, people are choosing new places to live. Now, there's strong data that would suggest that uh, the coasts in particular in uh, Canada are um, experiencing um, growing populations. Now, it's that's not to pit one part of the country against another, but given that uh, we're now working online, it redoubles the uh, implications of people being more focused on uh, quality of life as um, a life choice, but also as a significant um, economic question or driver of economic choices that would be relevant for all levels of government, but also at a local level for communities to sort of understand the implications of uh, new people with new perspectives uh, moving into their regions. So um, one of our former deputy ministers here used to call quality of life as a factor of production, just to put it into um, 
sort of business terms. It, it for us really is. We think we've got a lot of it. And as a result, it makes Nova Scotia a more attractive place. I'd like to jump in here as well. Uh, for me, uh, in Prince Albert, north of Prince Albert is some rural flying communities of Indigenous areas. And quality of life for them, uh, what digital access has, is given them the opportunity to access to education and training that they wouldn't have had. And uh, for them to be able to stay in their community and receive the education that they've needed and, and, and for job opportunities for them have given them the quality of life. It has given them the family support that they need to be able to be successful at it. And uh, that is giving them optimism and confidence. And I think that's something that we need to continue to be investing in as well and making sure that we have a strong digital network for that to continue and they have that support. And maybe I would just uh, come back to maybe where I started with this, which is to say, I think um, well-being has to do with some amount of dignity and uh, agency and self-determination in the place that you live. And if people are feeling that they are living very fragile economic lives um, and never knowing when the carpet that they're standing on is going to be pulled out from under them, it's really difficult to uh, believe, it, believe in the future. And mm -hmm. I, I think well-being starts with creating the enabling conditions for people to structure their lives uh, in, in a way as, as if the community that they're in or as if they their family units can be going concerns. And so I, I always start from what, what's going on in the economy, how much agency do local people have in their own economy and how much, um, how they can help shape lives as if they're not standing on one leg all the time. And I know whether people want to play bingo or people want to go to church or people want to, whatever people want to do, they want to go out in nature. That's all decisions that people get to make and shape their own well-being. Uh, but I, I know it's a chicken and the egg thing, but I think we really need to start up, uh, with the community economy. And since it's a conversation about what, what policy differences can we make, I think there's a real scale problem. Somebody talked about scale. I, I think all policy initiatives should be dynamically reconfigurable in terms of scale. It's like so many of the things, whether you are talking about that, it start with the infrastructure bank, all, it, all the size of programs are just too big for the smaller places. And why, why can't the scales be different in the way uh, programs are designed and, and, and adaptable to the place? And I think the other, the challenges are not all with policy. I think many of the challenges around community well-being or community economic well-being, which is where I start, really have to start on the ground because I think we need to become perhaps more coherent look in all the local places we live as economic actors in our own self-interest because with differently sized communities are differently abled when it uh, comes to the skill sets that are needed. And the municipalities, which are enormously challenged for all the things they have to do, they municipality doesn't equal community. Municipalities are one player in a community. And, and I think the hardest question for people to answer sometimes if you're standing in a place, pick any community, any of the ones where we are uh, speaking from today and say, who is responsible for the community economy here? Which body or who, who is it? Is it the mayor or, or is it some collection? I think we have, as Andrew Potter said, I really do think in his book called On Decline, we have a collective action problem. We do not have the proper architectures in many communities. I'm not saying all, obviously, to come together as local residents to make plans and build futures for ourselves in the places we live. So, I, And I think if we be, can become more coherent as economic actors, then it gets easier for businesses and governments to uh, work with us as, as what people say. We always want to talk to the community, but who is that? Is that something you see in your work, Patty, uh, in terms of you know, helping businesses along or, you know, seeing some sort of like regional organization in terms of regional economic strategies. Oh, absolutely. And it's gathering those partners together. And, you know, Nancy had referred to it as well as getting them all in the room and, and who is your community and what and what does that mean? And, um, you know, from the chamber aspect that, that you know, we're, we're in those discussions, 
And we're looking at it from the business aspect and, you know, that, that lens, you know, um, Zita had referred to what's the lens that you're putting on this and everybody has a different lens, but is that coming to a collaborative and collective agreement of what is best for the community in, in developing it and for its growth and opportunity? So what strategies should we be using to ensure that the wealth that's created from local economic development is staying in the community? Well, I can start by saying I'm actually thinking about getting a tattoo <laughs> and I'm getting I'm thinking about getting it on my face and it's going to say at the top, it matters who owns what. And we got to stop talking about GDP. If we're going to talk about anything like that, we should be talking about GDI, how much money actually stays in the community, especially when you're talking about rural communities. Now, I come from a place off the coast of Newfoundland where, I mean, the place was pillaged of its natural assets and very little of the financial return for that accrued to the places that we live. And so it mattered who owned what. And if, when we think about ownership, I, I am frightened to death of what we know is, is a, an avalanche of transition of business ownership in, in this country um, in the SMEs. And many of these SMEs, I, mean, I can name three on our little island of 2,500 people where the owners are aging out. And there is there are people locally who want to buy the businesses, but there is no money because banks have very restrictive lending policies to smaller and especially remote places. Um, and so they can't borrow the money. And so what's going to happen? These businesses will either close, uh, which would be dreadful to, to well-being, because I think you'd have to go to Gander to get an ale. That's a full day's outing. Um, and it's, or maybe they'll get bought. So I, I, I don't know what's the worst, because sometimes, what, and I see an avalanche of this coming, the ownership of things are going to transition away from where people live, away from the communities. And so then you've got the old kind of wrong model of ownership and return being very distant from where the consequences are felt. And so I think this ownership thing is a huge problem. We are in the midst of a community economies pilot project now um, and with five, five communities uh, working together on this. And we've organized our work into uh, finance. So how do we get money to flow into differently sized places? Um, and, you know, in the investment world, they say, well, it's too small. I mean, it's uh, too much friction for us to put money out there. And how do we know how it's going to be invested? So we can build a community finance fund model, maybe that other communities can adopt, that, that can be receptive for money coming in, that can help business transitions. So we're focused on data. We have very little community level economic data, even lagging data, let alone predictive data. And so I think that's hugely important because we, we don't even know what we're talking about. The architectures for collaboration locally that uh, that I mentioned is an, is another big focus, and then of course building out the skills and and knowledge sets that we need, and let's start with broadband. And for sure, we the, back to the scale problem. I think there's intent and there are policies in our country and good ones around getting broadband rolled out, but it's really difficult to get enormous ISPs to get interested in tiny little places. So I think we actually can develop a, a new business model that involves the big ISPs, but maybe has more local operators. So I think it's just thinking about in everything we do, how do we adapt with this lens of differently sized communities? And if you want to talk about fisheries policy, you know, we could be here for a very long time. We have fisheries policies now that make it pretty much impossible for new entrants, young people to come into the fishery. So that that is sort of undermines any economic future. So I, I think it's a whole host of things, but it's about optimizing for community economies. I'd like to jump in if I could. So uh, Zita, I think I think I'll join you in the tattoo, maybe not on my face, <laughs> um, but the, you know, this concept of who owns what I think is really important. I've, we've been doing a lot of work uh, locally uh, on local food and I, you know, in Alberta, of course, oil and gas has gone down and the, and, and most of the people that worked in oil and gas had farms, but they didn't really farm them. And most of the farmers you know, have either sold to large, large scale farms or they're just not farming them. And it was really interesting when we looked at who owns what. Um, I was working with a leader from Whitefish Lake First Nation who really had a vision about 
trying to get um, the nations to come together in some kind of a local food arrangement. And they, and we learned lots about the quality of our food and all of this way before COVID hit. And then we realized that grocery stores were empty, but talking about health. And somehow this, this gentleman talked me into taking permaculture design training. <laughs> um, and I, you know, what I came to realize in that, that, you know, as a business trained person, I hadn't really thought about before is this whole uh people connection, social connection, economic consciousness, and the and the connection to earth is so important to be balanced. And, and I think about when I think about policy, and I hadn't thought about this until you mentioned it, but when we look at what happened in even in just that particular economy, agriculture, those farms were passed from family member to family member at a time when uh, there wasn't things like capital gains taxes and all these other things that get in the way of people being able to invest in that farm to take it to the next level. And what was interesting in the permaculture world, they've decided that they don't care who owns the land. They're going to come together commune style and create this economy because the capital investment in the land is so overwhelming in most communities. And it's funny that we're struggling economically but people can't create an economy that we know there's people that would love to buy locally grown, whatever it is. <laughs> um, so there's those kind of policies, you know, and I think about agriculture, you know, the whole farm gate sales piece where from a local person, it looks a lot like policies have really gone in a huge pendulum to these places where only really large operators can actually implement the safety controls, the capital investments, the, you know, deal with the tax implications because they can write them off. So I think there's some kind of an imbalance there. And what I've learned, I, I you talk about economic and, and jobs, there is no predictability. The one trend that I am seeing is, is this gig economy where people are going to become more and more entrepreneurs and and uh, self providers, but I worry about what legislation is overlaying and hindering them entering markets, um, just because of things like you know the intense safety requirements. And and it's not that I don't appreciate that we have to balance safety, but it's that balance that I was talking about earlier that it feels like we've lost sometimes. Do you mind if I just pick up on a piece of that that uh, just came through? The, the, um, on the question of who owns what, Zita, I, uh, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to slip it in, but the idea that uh, I know that you support that I found really fascinating when we spoke recently was about putting labels, like we put food labels on our items to tell people where the money is actually going, which at a granular level raises the understanding of these issues. I grew up in uh, a part of our country where we always depended on federal funding and on industry from other places, steel, coal, heavy water plants, none of them took, none of them really rooted. And when we look to the Scandinavian countries and what they did to get both social and economic success, they invested in the things that at an indigenous kind of level, at a local level, meant the most it built on the assets that they, that they already had so um that's that feels like uh the dream and from my perspective it's not just who owns what but who benefits and how does the current economic system concentrate the wealth in places and in people and families and that sort of thing and that the path back beyond just the aspiration feels pretty complex to me when we think about the massive 800 pound gorilla that the economy and the way that it's set up currently operates. It feels at times, although I'm not an economist, like we're trying to put the toothpaste back uh, in the tube and uh, it's being squirted in every direction by so many of us uh, as well. So there's there are many layers to this, the conversations uh, around inequities. And I think, and frankly, what I was saying earlier about the incubation of there's got to be a better way than that way um, starts us in uh, more promising directions than the ones that were clearly, uh, you know, creating the inequities by region, by 
uh, systemic profiles by, and not to mention what it's done to the, uh, to the biosphere. Um, so, uh, it's, this, it feels like there's a long road path uh, back. And I, I take the points that have been made that it's not just for government to resolve. There's something about the conversations that we need to be having, uh, where all sectors are saying, yeah, that clearly wasn't working and we need to work more effectively, um, to, um, yeah, and 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 from our perspective, just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, it really uh, comes to asking more foundational questions at a local level about what does a successful society look like. Um, and if we ask that, uh, we'll get perhaps different choices along the path. And I just want to jump in here and yeah. say that I don't know that necessarily these things are not poli have policy implications as well, because, um, you know, Zita, what you mentioned about pending employee like ownership transitions, you know, is a solution to that something like employee more employee ownership and how do we enable yes. that in the economy? Yes. And if we're looking at labeling on uh, economic activity, that's something that can be enabled through public policy. Uh, someone in the chat has mentioned um, talking about agricultural land trusts, trying to get around the high cost of land for sustainable agriculture. And as well, someone also mentioned, was asking if someone could speak to uh, the social economy and what policy tools can be uh, leveraged to support that. So I just want to throw it back to you. I can speak to the social economy. I mean, people want to talk, but when you talk about social economy, you know, you're running the, the risk of being labeled a socialist. And uh, that, whereas, you know, the economy, when it works properly, is social. and to Danny's point, I think people have it too often given up and thinking, what the heck is the economy? But it doesn't have much to do with me. I'm just trying to survive in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the economy is a social tool and should be. And we all have an awful lot of power uh, to shape it. You know, it's a bit like that kid's rhyme. Hey, did a little, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughed to see such sport and the dish ran away with the spoon. And so we need to get the dish to bring the spoon back. And that's the whole thing about social economy. And, and I think classically, when people think about social economy, you think about social enterprise and how do we stimulate um, social enterprise? And there's a whole host of policies that are already in place for that. And not to say that we don't, uh, we can't be sharper about it. Uh, social finance, which is something that uh, exists, but you know, we sit uh, in in our country with you know a social finance fund that has trouble getting out because we need to build the plumbing for it to flow out uh, into differently sized uh, needs um, and social purchasing. So uh, in the things that we do, and Danny was talking about this economic nutrition labeling that we do, for everything that we sell in our short, fast enterprises, we have a label called an economic nutrition label, looks a lot like a food label that simply tells you where the money that you just spent with us goes. And so I think the more we can develop those kind of tools, the more every, every person can see that they are shaping the economy. And, it, and if, if I do it and you do it and she doesn't, he, we all do it then the dish will come back with the spoon, uh, which is where I think we're trying to go. What, somebody mentioned uh, employee ownership, and I absolutely, I see that Michael put this comment about land trust. Absolutely, land trusts are really uh, powerful tools that uh, I think we need to, to have more of. And employee ownership trusts. Now, I don't know if you know the work of Bill Young, and I know Bill's been doing an awful lot of work uh, in this area. It's, it's something that we, we just need to create the enabling tax legislation uh, to enable um, employee ownership. They, I mean, think of all these businesses where we know need to transition. The best owners, and this is well known, the best owners of any company are, are its employees. Uh, and then there are all kinds of models. On Fogo Island, you know, we have a cooperative that owns our fishery, which is really the only reason we live there anymore, uh, because the co-op optimizes for that local place. And the things that Shorefast we've done is uh, owned is, is in a social uh, business model, but owned by a charity. So it's also locally rooted. So it's get, getting these roots for, um, and I think that's how social economy works. But you could be an enormous company working in a community of any size, and you can't actually act in the interest of that community. And it can be formal, you know, by having community benefits agreements. But I, I think the community, again, needs to be coherent to work with that company that's present. I mean, and when we think about ESG, we have a lot of metrics for E and G and not nearly enough for S. I think there's a huge amount of work that needs to get done there that attaches to the places we live called communities. And I just want to throw it back to Patty. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing that I had thought about in this discussion that is is also you talked about what strategies that we should be using, right? And you know, when some of these um, businesses come to our communities that are larger, that uh, you know, we that bring economic opportunity, it's implementing procurement strategies that prioritize local sources as part of that process. And, you know, it's engaging the community and making, you know, and how can we involve them to be part of that and making sure it is available locally because that's the wealth then does stay there. It's, it's, it's creating and contributing to the success of the community. So they see the value of it and stays in the community. And then of course it's the shop local, you know, I'm getting right down to the local main street programs and that kind of thing and what it means to the SMEs, the community organizations, sports, arts, culture, that all contribute to the quality of life. From a macro level in terms of, we've talked a little bit about enabling community well-being for all, but I wondered if you had any specific thoughts on certain demographic quality of life considerations. So when we're thinking about communities, what needs to be done to, you know, say, empower young adults to be able to live and thrive within the communities that they grow up in or supporting older generations to be able to live and age in place in the communities that they've lived for many years? Well, I know how to get young people to move away from fishing communities. That's You want me to figure out how to do the opposite. Uh, we get them to move <laughs> away by making it impossible for them to ever own fishing licenses, which is pretty much, we've done a really good job of that. I, I think one of the big impediments, and we've seen this on Fogo Island, uh, I mean, there are a lot of young people that are move, have moved to the island uh, and wish to move to the island. We have a housing crisis. And why do we have a housing? We all know housing is a very, very complex thing. But one of the things that happens, especially in places like Fogo Island, is when banks look at mortgages, they will take a, a, a house on, on Fogo Island, compare it to uh, the, the value of the same house in St. John's and give it a haircut. And I don't know how much of a haircut, but at least 30%. So it makes it really difficult for people to get a mortgage. And so I think we do need an intervention um, around that. We, we can't leave to the markets uh, to decide what the value of a house should be and what a loan should be in rural places because we simply, they're the wrong scale for the mega systems. And I think that, uh, so making it possible to to have a place to live, making it possible for to find a new way for entrants to come into the fishery. These are the kind of things if you want young people to, to be there, if they're there to stay, if they're not there to come. And of course, we all talk about broadband. And I, and I mentioned earlier, I think, we do need to come up with some kind of a hybrid model that perhaps has an ISP that rolls out broadband, but maybe they don't need to be the people that uh, come and fix it if it's broken. So there needs to be like a, a local company that then picks up the, the care and, uh, and, and repair of, of, an, of a network. So anyway, I think it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a number of things. Uh, and it definitely, housing is such an enormous, enormous challenge. And, you know, if a house goes for sale on, on Fogo Island, it's as likely uh, to be bought by someone living in New York who, you know, sees it on Kijiji. And the next thing we know, it's rented out on Airbnb and the house is taken out of the housing stock and the money flies away. So I mean, the, this kind of, I was trying to get through this whole conversation without using the word financialization, but it's hard to. The financialization of life and of these important, it, critical, foundational things in our lives have all been uh, mostly financialized. And that, 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 I think, is the corrosion of community of, of any size, but you really see it in rural places. And the good thing about rural places, I mean, many good things about rural places, but I think they're actually more resilient because we are not yet, anyway, entirely dependent on mega systems that are beyond our control. Nancy, what do you see from that same question from the perspective of running a college? Yeah, so I'm. It's funny because you must have read my mind. I wanted to get the youth discussion on the table. So, uh, you know, in terms of youth being in the communities and staying in the communities. I, I firmly believe they need to be educated in the communities. And I think it's really important that there's a social network. I'm extremely proud of our government for really emphasizing work integrated learning because that is starting the conversation with our local folks. Uh, we have very similar, like we have companies that, you know, it's the 
the father and the son and maybe when the father's not no longer around the son will go to Edmonton and do something else you know and so we have to get broader engagement in that but it's really interesting when you think about the viability of smaller towns so the town that our municipality has a couple of towns the biggest one's 2,500 people um, is that if we can get the youth to be here and stay here and start having children, the grandparents move back, everyone moves back because they're ready. So so I think there's a few things that one is educating them. Uh, I think the other in the community and getting them their first jobs in the community. So I'm very disappointed about student funding, you know, step programs and things like that that get cut because that is what encourages small communities to employ students. Um, and then I think, you know, the other piece is having all those supports that they want. So you don't have to have the big box stores nowadays. You know, everybody's ordering from Amazon. So that kind of removed one issue for us. But you need to have those recreational facilities and the programs that they want to engage in. And then the last thing I'm going to say is that I think with this gig economy, it really is something about supporting entrepreneurs. And I know that Community Futures and other organizations do a great job with many entrepreneurs, but often entrepreneurs need, um, I guess, more of a sounding board on their product and their idea to start with before they're being asked to create big business plans. I think they need... I'm going to call a sandbox where they can start to work. And I don't find that at least in the communities I'm in, those sandboxes are very friendly. There are lots of development permits. There are lots of high priced accounting services that are required. And ultimately many of the entrepreneurs that we've worked with just cannot find their way through the bureaucracy to make their build, their business sustainable. And what we know about entrepreneurs is they're probably going to try four or five things and before one lands or 10 or 12. But uh, if their first experience in it is very daunting and they have to go up against municipalities and fight for development allowances and all that, they they do eventually just say, oh, forget it. I'll go get a job in Edmonton and work for a bigger company. So, so I think something more needs to be done about entrepreneurs and the millennial people that are coming up are about more about balance of home and family and being their own boss. And so I think the opportunities are right, but they need a better support network to get started, I think. And we're part of that. We're trying to figure our piece out in that as well. Uh, I think in a few minutes, we're going to open the floor up to questions from the audience. Uh, but before we do that, any sort of last words, last pushes, last policy ideas that you want to throw out there? I think we should maybe think about creating that kind of, I want to just come back to exactly that point about, about it's navigating whatever help or monies or programs are available. That's a full-time job in itself. And can we create like a Service Canada kind of one-stop shopping that says, here's what's available for uh, entrepreneurs in, in rural places or for community economic development initiatives? Somehow that needs to be uh brought together because um, I, I know on Fogwell and we Shorefast often perform that function as kind of impedance matching between what's out there and how the, the local person uh, can intersect it. And I also think we, we need to be, as we start to change our own minds uh, around to uh, becoming stronger economic, more coherent economic actors, yes, entrepreneurs and getting behind our entrepreneurs, <clears throat> but we can be actually fostering entrepreneurial communities. And I think that then you start to create a whole kind of mindset shift that values entrepreneurs and it becomes a place that uh, is known for it. And then it, you get a, you know, a whole lot more momentum around it. And yeah, it's, it isn't enough to just say, oh, look, there's a program. Uh, and, and many entrepreneurs are very reluctant, certainly uh, in, in our context, to apply for, you know, for loans. It's like, this is, a, my goodness, I'm going to put myself in debt, I haven't even started. Uh, and so I think there's, there is that hand-holding, that sandbox is, is absolutely needed. And, uh, and most of the professionals, whether they're lawyers or accountants or whatever, whatever, they don't generally live in places like Fogo Island. So I think there's an opportunity, actually, to grow um, some connective tissue. And I've often thought that lawyers and accountants need to come together in one firm focused on advising um, 
entrepreneurs that are trying to start something new. And, and maybe there's a subspecialty in there that's focused on r- rural and remote communities. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you talk about that because one of the things of the Rural Opportunities Fund, that was some of the, the things that communities were identifying in regards to supporting entrepreneurship and what they needed. And so there was some... Um, you know, the communities were making application for funding to help support that. And Community Futures was part of delivering that along with various partners of um, the Chamber of Commerces, the RITAs, et cetera, to help develop that network so they had those services available. So it's maybe a continuation of that across the country. Mm-hmm. Quick uh, thought that uh, arises for me as we think about these issues. Uh, it includes uh, the notion that there aren't quick fixes to a lot of these issues. And um, there's a lot that we're discovering that uh, creates intersections about why people would choose what demographics are uh, most satisfied in their work, why and what do they need in order to live somewhere. I'll, I'll point to a group that is particularly aggrieved, if you will, in the quality of life survey that we've done. And that relates to single parents who on the housing question are five times more likely to be renters and therefore perpetuating intergenerational cycles of not being able to uh, be able to afford a house or uh, get a leg up on uh, the economic opportunities that exist for other families that have that extra edge. And so the intersection within communities uh, that points to the ways that we support people will also support the economy um, uh, as we yeah, just try to piece it all together and not see it just as an economic issue, but uh, something that uh, is that sees more fully the intersection of economic and social issues. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that because that one really strikes a chord with me. It's something that in Alberta, we just went through Alberta 2030, which was a vision for post-secondary sector. And you, as you heard, I've been at this college for a very, very long time, almost my career. Um, but But that was the interesting piece for me is that our institution, about 43% of our students have children and about 35% of them are single parents. So it's uh, sometimes we have the mom and dad, but sometimes we have one uh, raising their children. And I would agree with you that um, it takes a different kind of support. Uh, They need uh, they need a community support. They need, you know, they need to not have to go very far from their network so that they have the support for their kids being cared for. And, you know, we try to get right in the community if we can. Um, But it's also about building that person's esteem because they have gone through multiple generations of that living in a poverty lifestyle. And, um, and and I would go back to the quick fix thing because I think that that's the other challenge with all of this is that we often like to measure what is success. And the easiest way to get good success is to start at the cream of the crop or the people that lead only the last mile um, and, and work with those folks. But I'm a believer that um, we're only as strong as the weakest link in our community, whether that's an economic link or a social link. And, you know, you think about it from a from a different perspective. If you think about rural crime as an example, I'll just throw that one out there. Um, if you think, well, you know, maybe what do we need to solve rural, uh, rural crime or crime in general? It's probably helping the people get out of poverty as opposed to building more jails and security. And I know people understand this, but I, I think sometimes we work on the symptoms as opposed to the underlying causes of these things. That's a great point, Nancy. I know in my own community where I live, um, the cost of land, the high cost of land has, you know, exacerbated this issue in the sense that, you know, there's a a lot of focus on, you know, trying to be able to build affordable housing or, and as additionally have like emergency shelter beds built within like a small community, but the cost of land and availability of land is such that the cost has gone way, way up and trying to get buy-in and help for, from the province and from the feds to be able to, you know, build those things in those small communities where maybe the numbers aren't very high. 
um, but the infrastructure is not there. Um, Jamie, why is land so expensive? That is, well, it's BC. Um, uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's the whole, I'm not going to go into the whole, but we're, we're about two and a half hours from Vancouver and about 30 minutes north of Whistler. And so, you know, looking at local contexts, and this is one of the things that we've seen is, you know, like, how do you build more housing in a community 30 minutes from an international tourist destination in a way that's going to actually benefit, um, potential like people of lower incomes uh, that need to create land trust yeah potentially create land trust we put they put land into it yeah anyway that is i mean if they at the very come back to place we started with place uh, it's come back to place if if we can't afford the land we stand on how is it going to be anything but a big slippery ball and if it's a big slippery ball how can anybody have quality of life like it's so foundational. So it, and, and to understanding what those sources of those uh, fundamental problems are around, say, the, co the cost or price of land. That's, uh, th I mean, those are the big hairy ones. Otherwise, we're just trying to put out enormous uh, forest fires with tiny little extinguishers. Absolutely. Maybe one other issue around rural that is is it's such an important one, uh, and I we see it on Fogo Island a lot because rural communities, uh, until let's say the last ten years, haven't generally seen a lot of new people moving in. Mostly, it's been families have been there. Um, if you think about childcare, and certainly on Fogo Island, we see this. There are the different generations in the family look after the kids when the parents are working, and. But now what we see is we've had people move to the island uh, who don't have grandparents or what, and family living there. So childcare is an enormous, enormous problem. And to solve it, because again, this is a, a scale problem. You know, we're an island of 2,500 people. Uh, so finding where to put it. And you'd think, oh, well, the obvious place is we've got, we've got this enormous school with all this spare space because we used to be 6,000 people and now we're 2,500. Well, what a great idea. Let's use the space in the school. And then you come up against, oh my goodness, all kinds of uh, structural problems around how spare space in school can be redeployed. It's so obvious. It's right there. But uh, I know people on our island have been working on this childcare challenge for, and these are determined, smart people. And we're two years in and glad I don't have a young child that needs to be looked after while I'm working. Uh, we've had a question come in. Local leadership is for key decision making around well-being. What do you do to cultivate leadership in promoting better participatory or engaged decision making processes in community futures on Fogo Island, Lac La Biche, and Nova Scotia? Well, one of the things I, I mentioned this, I'll start with uh, we formed on Fogo Island is a and not we've incorporated a not-for-profit called the Economic Development Partnership. Um, and it's still in its uh, early stages, but it it does it is the custodian of a strategic economic development plan for the island, and it has seats available for uh, the, the the bigger economic actors, including the municipality, and for other at large members. And so that is that it seems like a good vessel to to bring people together in in conversations around what is what are our priorities, what is it we need to do. Um, and, and I and I think without that kind of architecture, you know, we're we're railing at windmills. I think a lot of the time, or we're coming together in very ad hoc ways. Um, and how do you get people in a room? And how do you start a conversation? And and even when you have the most amazing conversation, and everybody goes home, well, who's 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 doing what next? So I really think building some form of. Uh, uh, I'll say formal because it can't just be ad hoc. I mean, our island runs on volunteers. I think there are like 36 or 40 community organizations that do all kinds of things. Uh, I think it's too much to expect them to carry the responsibility for the community economy. And so we're trying to build that structure and get that to work. You're absolutely correct there, Zita, in regards to building formality in and then who delivers what right? And what their services are and what their expertise is. And, uh, you know, making sure they have a seat at that table because communication is key at all times between those partnerships. 
I'm best at telling you what not to do. Um, <laughs> that would be, don't come in thinking that you've got the answers. Um, yeah. uh, if you're in our case, we're working at a provincial scale and, and we, we can only move at the speed of trust and that takes time and people need to see themselves in the conversations, uh, across sectors, across de demographies, um, in each of the communities. And even within, I showed you the map earlier of the 10 regions of Nova Scotia. Well, you can only imagine how each of those 10 regions is subdivided with when you live in the community. So there is something about um, engaging folks. I'm, I'm a big believer in all things related to citizen engagement as and when they can at the level and capacity that they can, which I think thematically ties back to you know, a lot of what's been said already, and in particular from uh, Zita when she was saying, what are the things that sort of animate the autonomous potential for people to be, in the words of Moses Cody from our province, masters of their own destiny, and uh, that they take it upon themselves to see that they're not dependent creatures in this world that's spinning around them, but actually they have the things, the tools they need to... Um, Imagine and uh, iterate toward uh, a future that better reflects what matters most to them. Yeah, I think I would pick up on that to say a um, couple of things. One is in Alberta, as everyone knows, we've been boom and bust forever. And I think that that has created a, a culture in our province of just wait, it'll come around again. <laughs> and, and so we often don't, rip the band-aid off and just we just we're just waiting and we're in a holding pattern and I think that affects everything that we're doing from land prices to everything um I would agree with you that I think it is it is the engagement and it's in, I, in it for the long haul um I think the one thing that I'm going to play on your comment of what not to do the one thing that I've seen and it's really genuine people trying to do something is that there's often a lot of these come together and plan and create this great plan. And then two years later, let's come together and plan and create this great <laughs> plan. And I, and I feel sometimes that, you know, I almost feel like it's more of a, I don't know, a societal change that there needs to be thought and uh, you know, how we all learn to become better recyclers. We all lead, need to learn to become better uh, lotus of control is internal kind of people. And I think that that actually has to start at the grade one or kindergarten or something like that. Um, and I, I see it with students that come to us, high performing students that are just waiting. They're waiting for instructors to feed them whatever it is they need to pass the exam. And then they're waiting for someone to offer them a job when they get out or or, you know, on the other scale, people that have had generations of living on social assistance and they're just subsisting. That's what they're doing. So I somehow feel like um, some of this needs to start small and it needs to be doing. And I feel like people need to actually be in their community with something quite small, do it, and it will build those relationships of, and that hey, we can actually do something here. So I feel it's maybe about the scalability again. I, you know, I, we've had experiences where we've had entrepreneurs come to us or community leaders from the Indigenous communities with some phenomenal ideas. And I personally have gone with them shopping for innovation funds to help them. But, but again, things are such a massive scale when you're trying to apply for those. And people are really trying to start small. They're trying to say, well, we did community gardens last year. Now we want to build some greenhouses. You know, it could be something very small like that, that just gets people back to let's get out, let's do something and feel like we can make a difference and, you know, and get some benefit out of it. And so I, I think there's something like that that needs to be more focused on the doing side. We are coming up to the end of our panel, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for uh, coming armed with such thoughtful and insightful ideas and for your respectful dialogue back and forth. It truly was a pleasure to listen uh, to you all and occasionally interject. Um, and thank you. And so we'll be going on to break momentarily. Hello.
Hello, everyone. My name is David Reevely. I'm an Ottawa reporter for The Logic, digital news site that covers high tech and innovation in Canada in all its many forms. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for the third panel of the day. Uh, I'll introduce our panelists and, and have them say a few words, and then we'll really get into it. Uh, joining me here, uh, actually not physically here, joining me all virtually, are Peggy Breckveld, who's the president of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. She's a dairy farmer uh, in Murillo, just west of Thunder Bay most of the time. Um, but she's been uh, an executive with the Ontario Federation of Agriculture for about 10 years now, speaking up for farmers, um, particularly in the province and uh, to the federal government. Also on the panel is Heather Hall. She's a professor at the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo. She's another Northern Ontarian. Um, she specializes in economic development and innovation in rural and Northern Canada, uh, with particular work in the agriculture and the mining sectors. Uh, we have Mark Pudlasley, who's the Director of Economic Policy and Initiatives with the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, um, and its work is on building capacity for First Nations to participate in projects on their territories, uh, particularly large things like dams and power projects and transmission lines, I think has the, been the bulk of the work so far. But the way things are going, there's bound to be an awful lot more. And uh, Matt Dunn, uh, who's the founder and executive director of the Center, of, Center on Rural Innovation, uh, which is in Vermont. He's a, a fellow who's had quite an interesting career. He's been a tech executive uh, at small companies and at Google, and he's been a state legislator in Vermont in both houses. So, so I'm going to begin by asking each of you in turn what innovation means in your sphere. Where I work, uh, I spend most of my time talking to people who work in office towers or maybe suburban uh, tech parks. And I'm here in the Canada 2020 headquarters. And if I look at the window and lean a little bit, I can see one of the parliament buildings. Uh, but outside there right now, um, they are giving away bags of potatoes to make the point to MPs who are in session, uh, that they need to pay attention to agriculture on Prince Edward Island, which at the moment can't export its potatoes to the United States because of a, a field fungus. And it's a big problem, and it's one that they have to put in a lot of effort to get legislators and policymakers to focus on. So uh, agriculture being mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the subject there, I'm gonna begin uh, with you, Peggy. Um, what does innovation look like in agriculture? So for me, I'm going to give a few examples. The first one is it's when you see farmers in the field using crop science and GPS to uh, feed a crop with the right rate at the right time in the right place and the right product. It's uh, innovation is when you see a uh, hydro spectrum work, which is really rainbow pictures of your leafy greens going through and then being able to tell what's the freshest leaf and the chemical analysis of each leaf as it goes through. So your spinach is being analyzed before it goes into the package to find the best produce. And it's about genomics that I can use to find the best health traits for my cows and ensure that they are um, that I can make wise breeding decisions. So it is exciting and it is beautiful and it certainly is tasty. <laughs> Heather, in the, uh, the areas that you study and the, the people you work with, what does innovation look like in that domain? Thanks, David. First, I'd just like to say thank you, uh, David, for the warm introduction. And thank you to Matthew and the team at Canada 2020 for organizing this roundtable this afternoon. It's been a really thought-provoking afternoon, and I'm uh, really excited to be part of these discussions today. I'm joining you, as uh, David mentioned, from the University of Waterloo. And I acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. 
When I look at what innovation uh, looks like in the research that I do, I think it's really important to recognize that it's happening right across rural Canada. But it often gets overlooked and ignored because it's happening in industries like mining, forestry, the fisheries, agriculture, like Peggy just mentioned, and tourism. We often know that rural innovation in um, our rural places is typically focused more on what's described in the academic research as doing, using, interacting, which is typically more incremental innovation that's focused on addressing specific suppliers, customers, or client needs. For Whereas what we often see happening um, in our cities is more science technology innovation, which is our more radical innovation that happens kind of in corporate R&D offices, research intensive SMEs and post-secondary institutions and other research centers. And this incremental innovation is often harder to measure in our traditional innovation metrics like patents. So I would certainly encourage people to look beyond the patents, beyond the cities and beyond science and technology. I've had the opportunity to work with um, innovation projects in Newfoundland and Labrador and Northern Ontario in particular. And some of my favorite examples of innovation are a bakery, uh, a mining supply and services company, and a social enterprise. And the bakery was uh, a company in rural Newfoundland in a town of only 400 people that started in the late 1970s. And what makes this bakery particularly innovative is that they were constantly learning and improving their business. They introduced new technologies and processes to ensure the traceability of their ingredients, utilizing both federal and provincial technology programs. They worked with the College of the North Atlantic and Memorial University to improve their machinery. They also participated in a regional business network that provided lean training, which resulted in a different floor pan for their operations and new training programs for their employees. They also designed their own custom packaging to protect their products during shipping after discovering that their products were being damaged. And they encouraged a culture of innovation within the business. So somewhat like Google's 20% time policy, which encourages workers to spend up to 20% of their time pursuing new ideas, workers at the bakery were encouraged to experiment with new recipes to improve or expand product offerings. Plus, they would always feed me treats every time I visit, which was always a bonus. Another company that I love is one from Sudbury, which is not really rural, but uh, it's where I grew up and it's certainly within the North. And it's a miner's lunchbox. And if I tilt my camera a little bit for a second, you can see it's the hot pink uh, miner's lunch pail behind me. And it was created by a miner by the name of Leo May in the 1950s, who was an underground miner at Inco. And at the time, there were no lunch rooms for miners to sit and eat their lunch. So they'd often sit on their tin lunch bag boxes, which would collapse under their weight. So he decided that he would create an affordable lightweight lunchbox that could withstand the weight of the miner. And by 1978, the company was incorporated and he was mass producing um, lunchboxes for nearly all the miners at Inco and many of the mining operations across Northern Ontario. Uh, Later in, in the company's history, his daughter Catherine took over the company and she introduced a more design oriented lunchbox. The original was designed to be tough, not pretty. Uh, but she wanted hers to be both. So she was able to use an anodizing process where an electrical charge was applied to the metal to create new colors and designs. Uh, She also appeared on Dragon's Den a few years ago to secure financing to expand her business, and she never missed an opportunity to market her product. Uh, Sudbury has a bit of a growing film industry, and so when actors are in town, she would often go down to the set and give them a lunchbox and the actors would then tweet their lunch boxes out to their followers, opening up new markets for her products. And one last example is Shorefest. And Zita Cobb was just on a fantastic panel, but it's worth really emphasizing how innovative Shorefast is. From their economic nutrition labels that showcases how much is contributed back into the local economy, to the involvement of local people in the destination experience and revitalizing and supporting traditional skills and industries like textiles, hand fishing, and furniture. And one of the things I love about Fogo Island is, is one of their initiatives around workshops, which is a collaboration between artists and designers from away and skilled rural artisans from Fogo Island. So to answer your original question about what rural innovation looks like, Innovation can happen in any organization, in any sector, in any place, and in all aspects of an organization's operations. And it can be new to the organization, new to a place, and new to the world. 
great. And I am in a sec going to uh, come back and ask a, for a little more detail about the bakery. Um, I'm a, a journalist, so I'm always pushing for, give me an example, give me an example, be specific, tell me about people. Uh, so thank you for all of that. Um, Mark, you are at the kind of intersection of big business and um, in many cases, very remote communities. What does innovation look like in that domain? Well, thank you. And it is my pleasure to speak to you today from Musqueam Territory here in British Columbia. I am a member of the Inflakatan First Nation, South Central British Columbia, and we are part of the Interior Salish. So I am the Director of Economic Policy at the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, which is now 80 members across Canada from Atlantic uh, right through to the Pacific, up to the North, uh, First Nations looking to participate in major projects on our territories. That's anything over $100 million. Uh, these projects will be, as you heard at the beginning, in anything from uh, electrical generation, electric transmission, seafood. Um, there are a number of projects around mining support. There's even a railway in there. What's happening is First Nations in remote parts of the country and rural communities do not have a lot of the economic base that they need to generate self-derived uh, income to pay for self-determination purposes. And those can be anything from community service through to language reclaiming to elder care to investing in other businesses. So at the coalition, a lot of our members are pushing to be able to acquire equity interests in major projects to provide that economic base. If you're from a remote part of the country, especially from a First Nation, mine is in a rural area, there, there's 90 to 95% unemployment just because there isn't an economic base and there aren't the jobs that are available like there would be in a urban community or certainly not in the south of the country. So we have situations in a lot of our members where a project proponent is being proposed, perhaps it's a mine, uh, increasingly it's going to be power as we start to move towards a net zero future that our members want to be part of. There are examples right now, some of them quite groundbreaking and what Indigenous people are doing to access the capital required to make those investments. The number one issue for Indigenous people in this country in remote and rural areas is access to capital. It's fine when a $5 billion pipeline shows up in your territory and you have an opportunity to acquire a 10% stake, but where do you get that money? For First Nations in this country, because of the way uh, the Indian Act is structured and the way the systems were set up in the governance, we don't own our assets. We don't own our reserve lands. We don't own our territories. They are held in trust for us by the government. And if any of you have tried to go to the bank and pledge government assets as collateral, you'll see how far you'll get. It's <laughs> not an easy way to go. So many of our members have found that, yeah, they could access capital, but the cost of it outstripped completely the economic reality of the projects involved. So for me, innovation right now are those tools that provide First Nations access to competitively priced capital. And that allows those communities to make those investments. And you ask for examples, I'll give you three. The largest one that has happened in First Nations has uh, happened on the East Coast. It was the acquiring of Clearwater Seafoods by a number of the First Nations out there and a partner. That transaction was over $1 billion. And First Nations, they, they were not granted that. They're buying it. And they did manage to find the capital act source to do that. And that was very creative. Two other examples in the green energy space, clean energy rather, uh, is uh, uh, Fort Nelson Fort, Fort Nelson First Nation is 100% owner of a proposed geothermal plant, 15 megawatts in Northern British Columbia. That part of the country is off the grid from the main BC Hydro network and is powered by an aging um, uh, power plant that is uh, natural gas fired. What this proposal is from the First Nation, they've always done the test drilling, is to repurpose depleted natural gas wells and use the heat from that to generate 15 megawatts of clean carbon neutral power, which will then feed the entire town of Fort Nelson, in which case the First Nations will be the energy provider and provide a carbon solution to that part of the province. In Alberta, it's my third example, there is a power line, 500 megawatts. Uh, sorry, 500 kV, excuse me, that is uh, connecting uh, uh, communities across and up into the oil sands of uh, northern Alberta. It has recently been acquired 40% of it by seven Indigenous communities. Again, they are buying that. It is not a grant. Each one of those situations has required very creative solutions to enable the First Nations to become part of the infrastructure that builds this country. Going forward, uh, and it was mentioned at the beginning, David mentioned it, there's going to be more of these. Yes, there are. The big one coming is the net zero challenge of 2030 and 2050. 
Canada, in order to move off electric, um, so off carbon transportation sources, never mind anything else, will have to have 50% of the car fleet, light trucks and cars in this country by the year 2050 on electric power. That will require batteries. In order to build that, we will need up to 14 times more nickel, copper, uh, lithium, rare earths to build that infrastructure in the next eight years. Consider this. It takes nine to 12 years in this country to get a mine from permit to production. How will we get to 14 times more nickel, copper, lithium in the same period if we do not have the innovative tools in place to allow First Nations to control the destiny of what's happening in their territories? The same goes for electricity. We are going to need massive amounts of clean electricity and transmission lines crossing the country in order to power all the vehicles, never mind everything else. Uh, SNP in the United States has indicated worldwide in the next eight years, we will need one trillion US dollars of investment into the mining space and six trillion into the clean energy generation space just to meet 2030 targets. First Nations, we know this power is going to come from our territories. The mines, the metals, they're all going to come from our territories. And if we are having any hope to meet the national targets, we're going to need innovative solutions for the development and, and involvement of First Nations directly into any of those projects. Those are absolutely staggering amounts of money that you're yeah. talking about. Um, and I want to dig into that as well, uh, but uh, get our final panelist in. Matt Dunn, tell us what innovation looks like in small town America these days. Sure. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm based in Heartland, Vermont, uh, and we sometimes like to think of ourselves as an extension of Canada. So we, we feel <laughs> very comfortable uh, on this panel. Um, and we our headquarters is on uh, lands that was uh, with the Abenaki uh, tribe in our region of the country. Uh, and uh, but we are a national action tank, uh, and so we work with uh, rural communities across uh, the whole country. We're in uh, in 25 communities in 20 states, um, and what we are doing is uh, a little more of the traditional sense of uh, technology innovation. Uh, I would say that all of the uh, panelists' examples to date are certainly rural innovation in really interesting ways. Um, but what we saw was that the recovery from the 2008 recession Session was fundamentally unequal in rural and urban places in the United States, where urban places came roaring right back and rural not so much. And the driver of that was automation, globalization with the help of technology, and the decline of entrepreneurship for the 30 years prior to the 2008 uh, recession. And, and what it was was that automation jobs, uh, automation created millions and millions of jobs uh, in the United States, but it also removed millions and millions of jobs. And the problem is it almost exclusively created them in urban places and almost exclusively removed them in rural. And if you look at those kinds of technology jobs, the fruits of automation, uh, they're reflected in computer and math jobs. Uh, and before COVID, uh, which is the last time we've looked at this data, uh, rural America represented 15% of the nation's workforce, but only 5% of the computer and math jobs. And we believe that because of the importance of those computer and math jobs in creating economic mobility and being able to create jobs and companies that are resilient in the face of automation, we need to bring that 5% up to 15%. And so that's what we're dedicated to. And to be clear, we don't believe that all uh, tech not computer and math jobs should be in rural or that all rural jobs should be computer and math jobs. But a proportion of it needs to be so that there's some uh, ownership of production in the age of automation. Uh, so we work with incredible change agents in small towns between five and 50,000 in population uh, all across the country as they're building uh, technology hubs and innovation ecosystems uh, where they're setting up uh, scalable tech accelerators and coding training programs. They're building out inclusive tech culture events and activities, 
Uh, and we're finding new ways to bring uh, venture capital and seed capital to those places, either through a fund that, that we stood up, but also in finding those folks who want to make investments in new, innovative uh, technology companies uh, and are look, willing to look beyond uh, the few zip codes where most of the venture capital goes uh, today. Uh, and so we've got some unbelievable uh, startups and communities that are happening all across the country uh, in Springfield. Field, Vermont, which is just down the road from us. Uh, we have uh, folks who are harnessing the power of AI to allow for institutions to detect suicide risk uh, using simple, short surveys uh, that allow for identifying uh, when someone is at risk and being able to appropriately apply interventions to reduce uh, the suicide problems that are facing many uh, in, in rural America, in prison systems, and in other locations, particularly during COVID. Uh, in Marquette, Michigan, uh, which is on the UP, which I believe is north of Ottawa, uh, and, uh, and they claim north of a majority of the population of, of Canada, um, there is a, a group of entrepreneurs who are working out of the uh, co-work space up there uh, and came out of Northern Michigan University's engineering program. Uh, spent some time at NASA and are now designing new systems for removing space junk, uh, actually having automated systems to be able to go and collect uh, space debris, be able to collect it in a central place and bring it back down. They're working directly with NASA and they already have a revenue stream based on the work that they're doing with satellites and satellite information. Uh, and then, you know, uh, even places like Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, which is in the upper Mississippi Delta, uh, in the boot of, of Missouri, uh, where a couple of folks who were from there uh, and were starting a small software project shop uh, decided that they didn't want to move to big cities like everyone was telling them they'd have to. They started sourcing their talent, both from the uh, local university, but also from uh, veterans and other folks who were uh, underemployed in the area, helped train them through project-based learning, uh, bring them into the firm. Uh, they added on top of that a youth coding league to start folks even earlier, and then started a pitch competition. Uh, and they now have companies that are getting uh, launched in Cape Girardeau that are bringing people back home who had grown up there, left for either uh, college or what they felt was uh, the only opportunity they had to be aspirational. And they're now coming back, starting their companies uh, in the Codify co-work space uh, and attracting venture capital to be able to scale them out. So that's what we do uh, at the Center on Rural Innovation is to do that kind of capacity building work uh, with communities that have figured it out, uh, that that's where they wanna go. We help connect them to each other and create a coalition um, because it's going to be hard for one small community that has an innovation hub to be successful on their own because they won't have the deal flow or necessarily the talent flow to attract uh, remote hiring partners. Um, but working as a coalition and a collective, we're finding virtual scale and just some really exciting collaboration and innovation and the opportunity to unlock the unbelievable entrepreneurial talent that's across rural communities. That is tremendous. Uh, Heather Hall, I'm gonna come to you in a sec uh, with a question about the bakery. But before I do, I'm gonna point out that we have our first question in the chat. Uh, and if you have things you wanna know uh, from the panelists, please don't hesitate to raise those things in the chat and I'll get to them as quickly as I'm able. Uh, and it'll help us talk about the things that you wanna hear about. Uh, but about the bakery, which is what I want to hear about, um, how did they put together the, the funding to do all these things? So many small businesses are just hanging on by their fingernails. Uh, so how do they fund it? Uh, part of it was they were able to access some of the provincial and federal funding programs that allowed them to work in partnership with CNA and, and Memorial University. So certainly I think a lot of our uh, funding programs, particularly at the provincial levels that um, cater to rural business and entrepreneurship support are really vital. Um, but then they also use their own resources to join a network with uh, a number of other manufacturing companies in this small rural region uh, that was hosted by the Canadian manufacturers and exporters. And so they would meet usually monthly, uh, tour each other's businesses, 
uh, share ideas, get insights from CME on different training and processes, and then be able to access some of the network that CME could bring through the college and through the university. So various researchers and others who could help them with what they were doing within their businesses. And so in some instances, for some of the other businesses, uh, part of that network, they were able to partner with researchers. So it was kind of a win-win where the researchers were able to do things that would benefit their their research programs, but then also contribute back to the businesses and help them with some of their products and processes. But it sounds like just knowing where to plug in means essentially having a second job in addition to baking. And that's one of the things I think that's so important and and Matt also discussed was just having those ecosystems and those networks. So having those people that can help plug in rural entrepreneurs into those networks are really vital. Um, and so I think, you know, we certainly heard it on the last panel as well with, with Zita Cobb saying that often they act in that way at Shorefest, connecting people on Fogo Island with some of these government programs or other programs that they might be able to tap into. And those gatekeepers are really important, I think, for rural entrepreneurs to be able to access those resources. Uh, Peggy Breckveld, how does this play out in agriculture? We're talking about, in many cases, gigantic capital outlays required to install whole new generations of systems. Where, where do farmers go to find that money? I think we generally go to a bank. I, I think <laughs> the more interesting question is, uh, more interesting question is how do you encourage investment in rural Ontario? Sure. And I, I think that you invest in things or you value, you invest in things you either value or things that you see are rare and that you uh, you don't want to lose. And I think that's probably the, the interesting question is, do we value and do we see rural Ontario as unique and special and something we should take care of? And so in Ontario, I mean, we should see value in rural Ontario. Just the farming community alone in our province, they can do the math to find what it is in Canada, but... I just in Ontario is $47 billion in GDP per year. And we employ in the whole food chain, 860,000 people. And so there is value there that we sometimes forget. Uh, the second thing is we sometimes forget about what is rare and special about rural Ontario. And in the agriculture community, it's farmland. And in Ontario, only 5% of our farmland is actually arable. And that's not that much. And we are currently losing about 175 acres a day to development. And if you want to know what 175 acres a day looks like, it's approximately 653 boxes of cereal a day that we are losing to development or 316,000 bottles of wine if you're into great country. And if you're into sweets on your breakfast in the morning, it's 611,000 jars of jam. So we feed a lot of people in this province and in this country uh, across the land. And it isn't just that we grow food, because I think that matters to everybody on this uh, call, everybody in this country, uh, food. But beyond that, we also are carbon sequesterers because we grow plants, we grow things, and we have wildlife living on our properties. We are water filtration systems as rain goes through our fields down into the aquifers under the soil. And we are caretakers of the land and generally farmers look to farm in generations. They don't think about it in years. They think about it in generations. And so for all of those things, if we value those things, then we invest in them. And so investment might be continuing to help us to uh, look at better technologies and such. It might be simple things as healthy hubs and broadband, which we heard lots about today, um, that help us even do greater things on our farm. Uh, we've changed in agriculture from the early 1900s, you fed about 18 people per uh, per acre or per farm, sorry, per farm. And we're now at um, 120 families or something we feed. Like, really, we have done so much to invest in being the most 
and doing the most with uh, the tools and the resources we have. Um, now there's a look to how do we invest and how do we uh, encourage further sequestration? How do we encourage those four R's that I talked about earlier, right place, right time, right product, uh, right rate, et cetera. And so I think that investment will come from there. What form should that investment take? Um, I mean, you've made a case for why it's really important, but whose money are we talking about? Private sector money, government money, other forms of, of cooperative work? So I actually think both. I think that government in its effort to ensure the values of Canadians has a role to say, uh, we think that carbon sequestration is important and there's some ecological goods and services here and we should invest in our, our farmers. I also think that private industry should and can and does. Uh, that is the farmers themselves. But it's also about uh, companies that want to set up food processing in rural areas because it's close to the source of the food they want to, to use. Um, if I, I, I would love to see more people uh, grow spirits or uh, make spirits out of, out of whiskey, out of <laughs> wheat, or to, um, to make more jam, to put more peaches into cans. We lost that in Niagara area a number of years ago. I'd love to see more of that. And I think there's potential for it, but uh, it certainly takes somebody to, with bold vision to see that rural Ontario is something to cherish and to uh, value. And it's not the poor cousin of the city. It's just different. And we're certainly uh, important to this country as well. Uh, Mark Podlasley, I'm going to put the question from the chat to you. Um, the, uh, the First Nations that got together uh, on the East Coast to buy Clearwater, where did they get a billion dollars from? Oh, so... A major important, a major part of where that money came through was leveraging existing uh, First Nations financial organizations. There's one particular called the First Nations Finance Authority. The Finance Authority has been in existence for a number of years. And what they do is that they will leverage future revenues to make the capital available now by selling bonds in Toronto and New York. They have financed over a billion dollars across the country to those First Nations who can access their services. It's one of the, the, the means of, of accessing capital that we almost never hear about in the media. Uh, how many people know that First Nations in Canada are accessing the bond market in New York to raise capital to put into investments for uh, building the communities? The great thing about the Clearwater deal and the other ones that I mentioned, plus dozens of others, is that First Nations in rural communities want to be in rural communities. We like where we live. It's our territory. It's our home. It's not seen as like, oh, it's a poor thing that you can't be in downtown Toronto and go get a latte at midnight. That's not of importance to our members. So for, for Canada, it's useful for the country to not have the rural areas depopulated. Our national wealth, Peggy pointed out too, our national wealth comes from the land. It comes from territories that are outside of downtown Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, and Calgary. Those parts are important to the country, but the rural parts, that's where things are coming from. I pointed out earlier as well, the uh, big growth that's coming with net zero into rural communities. What's happening in those places as nations are starting to access capital, they're going through a number of means and every one of them is bespoke. In terms of the uh, power line that I mentioned in rural Alberta, some of that was offered as a carry by the company, realizing that having a First Nation partner is good for their business, not just from the stopping of delays that might happen on projects, but it allows a broader base of employees who then are rurally based. You don't have to fly people in from urban centers. So in that case, uh, some of the money came from own sources that the communities had themselves. Others were through loan guarantees, like uh, in Alberta, there's the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Fund, which provides loan guarantees to those projects that can prove that they have an ongoing and future revenue stream that can be leveraged. In some cases, it's the companies themselves doing the carry of the construction cost until it's an in-service date to allow revenues to flow to the First Nations. It, it just depends on the project and the proponents. But back to what you asked for before, what is creativity? What is innovation in rural areas? This is it. Many people don't realize that in parts of the Canada, in rural parts of Canada, you'll have a 90, 95% Indigenous population. We are the only people there. And 
where's the power going to come from for our, our, our cities? Where's the, where are the minerals going to come to power our vehicles? The, the, that is the big growth area for innovation right now in this country. And it's in endure, indigenous and rural communities. What needs do these communities have that are hard to finance this way? Infrastructure uh, for community infrastructure itself can be really hard to finance. One is that if you're in a rural fly in community somewhere in northern Canada, you're never going to have a, a, a cost recovery ever on a water plant on terms of electrical infrastructure. You're not going to have that in, in, in any of those services. So that from public services is really tough. The other things that come in tough as well is satellite connectivity. Um, there are creative solutions slowly coming like this, the, the Elon Musk's, um, uh, the link that he's selling in, in terms of connectivity. Yes, but those are coming from outside, but other stuff's really hard to fund. The other thing that's really hard to get into those communities is economic development. For example, generating uh, businesses that can actually, uh, sustain themselves. A population base in a flying community can, can be too small for that. Mm -hmm. which is why when there are major projects that show up into communities, whether a mine or a transmission line or a railway, it's very important for the First Nation to become involved some way because we haven't got a lot of other options. Um, so Matt Dunn, in the, the communities where you've worked, what are the, the best sources of capital for the, the kinds of projects that you've been talking about? Maybe tell us about uh, Cape Girardeau in particular, if you can. Sure. So... Uh, there, there are a few different pieces to it. Um, one is on just making sure that the, the narrative shift happens uh, so that people who have resources, who are experienced investors, uh, look outside the bounds of the big cities where they're assuming that all that technology is going to take place. Um, and as someone who grew up in a rural place and actually did technology in a rural place, I, I was kind of surprised when we started on this journey how much blowback we got, where I literally was asked, well, you know, can rural people actually code, right? Do, do they use computers out there? I mean, it was, Peggy, you would have... Um, <laughs> I am horrified. You, you, might, you might have uh, <laughs> been very loud in these meetings. It was just, it was so frustrating, right? Because of course, and in fact, the uh, innovative spirit, when you don't have someone that you have to, that you can call on to do all the things for you, you figure it out. Uh, and so it, anyway, so so changing that narrative has been so important. Uh, we took on some of that ourselves because as I was trying to get, you know, friends that I'd made in Silicon Valley who did do investments that they should come and look at these companies. They were like, Matt, I'm, I'm not going to spend the time with a, you know, eight company accelerator. But if you stand up a fund, we'll be an investor. A small investor. So we're still not sure this works, but we'll give it a shot. And so we were able to stand up a seed fund uh, that is investing explicitly in scalable tech companies in rural places that are economically struggling. And what was exciting is not only the validation that came uh, when we actually funded one of these companies and they started to take off, but that resources came uh, out of the woodwork. Uh, to be able to complete their round of funding. So people in those areas have been successful in many of the traditional uh, kinds of businesses in that area, but just weren't used to investing in a company that didn't have you know, a, a large you know, grain silo or a, uh, a manufacturing plant with uh, depreciable assets. And so they were looking for a first mover. Uh, but from that point, they then were able to complete their rounds. Um, and then they're now starting to attract other kinds of capital um, that's coming in. Um, and then the other form of capital, other than investment capital, uh, has been in the form of technical assistance capital. So uh, when we started working on this, we got a little bit of philanthropic dollars to work with our pilot community. Uh, we then secured one of the uh, a, a, a economic development administration uh, uh, grant uh, for that community to be able to allow them to stand up an accelerator program for scalable tech companies and try to draw folks from Dartmouth College and other places into it. And we were the only completely rural place in the country to get one of those grants at that time. And the Economic Development Administration, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, came to us and said, OK, it's a problem that you were the only rural place in the country to get this can we give you a contract to go and find other change agents and communities to figure out how to do this? And we were clear we'd only done it in one place, but they were willing to take that bet 
um, that we would be able to find like-minded rural people and be able to work with them, not to do it for them or to like own and operate these things all over the place, but empower them to build on what they had already started and then be able to apply for this kind of federal funding that had always been there, but they hadn't realized it was there for them. And so we were able to do that. And in three years, we've been able to help uh, rural communities raise over $18 million to support these kinds of accelerator programs and tech culture building uh, areas around co-work spaces and other things um, to be able to uh, build that kind of economy in their area. So, so there's, there's the capital that comes from the investment capital, there's the capital that comes in technical insistence, and then that can allow for the kinds of funds that are intended to support these uh, types of innovation centers to be able to show up in places that they wouldn't have otherwise. So, uh, Peggy Breckveld, um, what I've just heard Matt talk about a bit is uh, when it comes to technical capital, is getting people together to do some of this important work. And um, I mean, I've written about the effort in Canada to rebuild the biopharma manufacturing capacity. Um, FP Champagne has been talking about uh, uh, landing the last pieces of a battery supply chain uh, for the country. In agriculture, which is kind of by definition spread out, low density, how do you achieve uh, those kinds of connections that are are necessary for or seem to be necessary for the kind of innovation that we're talking about? Again, I go back to uh, ensuring that all the resources are there that farmers need to do the things that they need to do to do the to grow the great food. So some of it's about investment in rural communities and in rural uh, infrastructure. Um, it's about roads and bridges and things, really simple things that um, municipalities struggle to actually get done. Uh, it's about even it's about broadband and infrastructure such as affordable energy. In Ontario, the energy costs for electricity are about three times as much in rural Ontario as it is in the cities. And I think that's significant and uh, detrimental if we want to move the industry towards more electric type uh resources. And uh, the last thing is, every once in a while, you hit um, things that just don't work in rural Ontario, and you really wish they would. Um, so I'm going to give a personal example. And one of them is the challenge of right to repair. And this is actually something government could do something about. On my farm, it's hard for me to invest in a new tractor, because the new technologies, etc., have uh, certain conditions that only an authorized dealer can service it. And I live in a community that does not have a tractor dealer. And in fact, when I want to buy a tractor, I have to travel either into the United States, which the biggest center is at least four, six hours away, and otherwise to Manitoba, and the closest dealer is six to eight hours away. And so I think to myself, I, if you give me the tools and the ability to diagnose it, I could probably fix it at home or at least in my city with my manufacturers that are awesome in, in Thunder Bay, et cetera. Um, but that is something that provincially there are some rules and federally there's some copyright rules that I think there could be some changes. So it's sometimes looking through a lens of, will this work in remote communities? Will this work in rural areas or places where I can't get to an electric plug-in station? <laughs> Um, and those types of conversations, I think, are sometimes missing when we want to do investment in rural Ontario. Farmers are going to adopt, adapt and uh, use new technologies when they can. But there are some things that hold us back. And, and those kind of things are sometimes we just didn't think beyond the box. We have to think outside the box. On uh, right to repair, there was a bill in the last parliament. It's a private member's bill, and I think it ended up being passed unanimously after full examination, which just never happens with private members' bills. There are <laughs> statements, they come out, they disappear, and then it 
died with the election call. We were talking about it That's at right. the office and people were, were in the newsroom. People were talking uh, about iPhones and that sort of thing. And eventually someone said, this is kind of about iPhones, but it's really about tractors. Um, <laughs> and huge swaths of the, of the economy where people who live in cities don't necessarily think. That's right. Uh, Heather Hall, when it comes to um, getting the benefits of ecosystems and clusters and you know, people working together oftentimes in a relatively geographically contained area. How do we get those benefits into rural areas where there are fewer people and they tend to live farther apart? Oh Get me off there mute. Um, I think Matt's talked about some of the examples, particularly with his organization, is having these networks and these organizations that can help build capacity and connect rural entrepreneurs and rural communities with services that might be in regional centers. Um, I think certainly there are some existing uh, rural and regional different kinds of networks across the country. For example, in Nova Scotia, they have regional enterprise networks that really try to um, ensure that there's a collaborative approach to regional economic development, rural development in, in Nova Scotia and support for businesses. And so those types of organizations help provide those networks and help build um, those connections. And again, that business network that we talked about in, in rural Newfoundland was another way of trying to get access and provide kind of those networks to, to rural businesses. So I think certainly um, having organizations, people on the ground in rural communities that can help strengthen capacity, build capacity and support entrepreneurs is really vital. Um, in rural Ontario, oftentimes we still do have um, some regional staff on the ground in rural northern um, communities. We also have the community futures offices. Uh, there was a panel before us that had a representative from um, community futures and they're spread out across the country oftentimes embedded in their local communities. And so I think those organizations really play a strong role. One of the things I also wanted to touch on, and, and I think we've we've heard it a little bit uh, from various panelists, is just the, the importance of having that capacity. And oftentimes what we see in our rural communities is this, this kind of paradox where regions that have the greatest need for innovation support, uh, which are often our rural regions, are typically those with the lowest capacity to be able to use public policy instruments and absorb funds that might be available in a way that's going to significantly change their development trajectories. And so what this means is that we really need to address those capacity deficits that exist in many rural communities. So that might mean including people who are trained in rural development that are embedded in local communities, um, having senior governments or other organizations on the ground and also supporting robust rural institutions. And we certainly saw a large dismantling of a lot of our rural institutions over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, from the regional economic development boards in, in Newfoundland and Labrador to others um, across the country. And so we really need to start building back up that capacity so that when opportunities do come to rural communities, they have the capacity there to be able to take advantage of it. Mark? But lastly, what does that capacity building look like in Indigenous communities that you've worked with? Well, the, the Major Projects Coalition is, is a capacity building organization. We are a nonprofit. We do not take profit in, in the projects. We don't actually support individual projects per se or a sector, an individual uh, proposal. What we do is we act for those 80 First Nation members who do need the capacity in economics, engineering. Uh, there's a, an incredible amount of talent that is available in Indigenous communities across the country, but not always in the rural areas. So uh, in our, our communities, for example, most on average, over 50 percent of Indigenous people live in Canadian cities. They don't live in the rural communities. But what that does mean is that a lot of the talent that the communities in the rural parts of the country need, they haven't got in-house. They, they, they have to find it. One. Second, you have to find trustworthy, trustworthy, because as Matt pointed out, there is an attitude at times of that, you know, oh, you poor people out there in the sticks, <laughs> don't know what you're doing. It's like, no, they aren't doing that. I want to tell a quick story. I, I was doing a lot of work for a, a group called the First Nations Energy and Mining Council. And what it was, was it was leveling the playing field. It's the same thing we do at the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, laying the 
leveling the playing field in talent, capacity, questions between the rural and remote and the urban. So in that case, our organization is 80% Indigenous, Indigenous lawyers, Indigenous economic, uh, economists, Indigenous engineers, hydrologists, that exists. We bring that into those communities. Longer term, once these projects are in place, then there has to be a strategy in place in the communities to start to build up talent like that, that will stay. And that is a challenge. Um, quick, quick story. Uh, when I was with the Energy and Mining Council, uh, I was out uh, dealing with a lot of the uh, LNG um, pipeline companies that were looking to put in natural gas, liquefied natural gas projects. And I was in uh, a northern community in British Columbia. I, I visited almost all of them at the time were being proposed by rural. I went in, gave a presentation, um, I gave a presentation showing world energy markets, how, why this was happening, where the gas flows were happening worldwide, had a world map up showing LNG flows around the world. And there was nothing coming from Canada, most of it coming from Russia into Western Europe or from uh, Asia and, and the Middle East to different places. And an elder about 90 years old stops me and goes, wait, go back to that map. And I said, why? And I pulled out the map and she got up. And now remember, she's about 90 years old, English was not her first language. It, the indigenous language was her first language. And in English, she said, now this map, now that Putin has seized Ukraine here and the natural gas can't go to Western Europe, could the gas from our territory here in British Columbia flow the other way to serve as Western Europe from across the Atlantic? And I sat there and I was like, wow, no one's ever asked me that. So I answered the question. Afterwards, I sat down and said, ma'am, where did you learn to ask? Oh, I get this magazine every month in the mail called The Economist. And I go through it from front to back. And it's like rural communities are not disconnected. We know what's going on in the rest of the world. We know that there may not be the capacity we have, but we understand what's at stake. So the question you ask, how do you build out the capacity? You have to, at this point, from an Indigenous perspective, you access the talent that you can, where you can, and you've got to be creative to connect those pieces to get to your objective. And it's happening. It's just never reported. <laughs> well, tell me more about them and we'll report on them with the logic. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually working on a story about an attempt to lay a fiber optic cable into a Calorite uh, where they rely on satellite internet. Uh, and I'll give away what I think is probably going to be one of the better lines in it. Um, there's a, a drone company, very small, but they, you know, mining companies want surveying and, and there's mapping and whatnot that needs to be done. Um, and, uh, but they, they produce these huge files that they can't reliably get to clients in the South. So typically what they'll do is they'll start uploading them. Um, and they will also tether a cell phone that I guess connects to a copper uh, wire connection down the line and send it that way. And then they'll pop an SD card in the mail. And more often than not, it's the SD card that actually gets to the client before the file does, um, having to be physically flown someplace south, sorted, moved to another city, and then uh, handed off. It's, it's obviously a huge problem for someone trying to do something very innovative there. Um, so broadband is obviously a gigantic uh, need in a lot of particularly remote areas in, in Canada. Um, Matt Dunn, I'm, I'm going to ask you about America first, though. Mm -hmm. Do you have an instance of a place where you know, before broadband, there was very little, and then after broadband arrived, a place was able to really take off? We have, we have a few examples of those. I mean, one of the... <laughs> What, one of my favorite examples when we were part of coalitions that were advocating for uh, the massive investment that has finally come through in the infrastructure bill in the United States um, about, uh, you know, a library in, near where I live. Uh, and it was a beautiful library, very popular. And on, you know, any given Sunday, uh, the parking lot would be absolutely full, which isn't so weird, except for the fact that the library was closed on Sunday. And it was people sitting in their cars, usually with their cars running, getting the Wi-Fi that was bleeding out of the windows because the only place that they had wired was the library through a federal partnership to be able to bring Wi-Fi or bring bring broadband to that library. Wow. Uh, and and this is you know this is in this century, right? That's a crazy thing. And they would you know start figuring out who was going to get food to you know share with each other and who had the coffee pot and all of that it, car to car outside of a library. So we've, we, and we've seen instances though of innovative rural communities that just went and built fiber to the home, 
right? Not marginal DSL or even, uh, you know, wireless. They actually banded together, sometimes used uh, public uh, uh, electric companies or, or cooperative electric companies as the basis to be able to build it out. And then once they got uh, that world-class broadband, were able to retain and encourage people to come home. Uh, to be able to to leverage it, uh, and and part of it was that companies could be successful, like in uh, and like the ones in Cape Girardeau that I mentioned that had done that kind of broadband investment way early on, um, but also because they knew that their kids would have access to the kind of homework resources that they were just afraid they wouldn't be able to have, and so it has a multitude of effects. Uh, I mean, Wilson, North Carolina is our classic example uh, in the United States. It was the first municipality to build fiber optic gigabit speed Internet uh, to every person in that community. And they did it as a former tobacco play, uh, community. Right. If tobacco fell. Wilson crashed. And they said, we've got to do something about it. We have this municipal electric company. We can be a first mover. And they went and built it out. They have paid off the debt on building out that fiber to the home, and they're now using the revenue from that to build an innovation space, to start up an accelerator program, to start training its residents uh, over 50% uh, who are BIPOC, uh, and, and be able to create a new source of, uh, uh, of talent and innovation and technologists uh, in a place that is, you know, <laughs> taking it... Um, a hard road to transition from its old economy uh, to something else. Uh, Peggy Breckfeld, what difference does the arrival of broadband make in the life of a farming family? Well, we saw it during the pandemic. Uh, we saw those who had broadband had the ability to move to virtual platforms to do uh, ordering in a different way and to actually that their kids could do school and the, and the parents could still do business at the same time, which sounds <laughs> unusual to people in li who live in cities, but my kids had to turn off their screens so that I could do business. And that holds everybody up and makes everybody discouraged. Um, so it, it's about us adopting newer technologies. If I want to install a, a milk robot, I need good broadband or Wi-Fi uh, so that they can actually um, monitor the machines and tell me if the machine's not working so I can help with the health of the cow. Um, this, is, this is reality for today, and it holds people back when they don't have broadband. Uh, I'm going to take a question from the chat um, that I'm going to put to uh, Mark Podlasley. Uh, the question is, what policy changes do we need to be thinking about to support indigenous financial institutions? Okay, uh, the, the broader, bigger one first is what policy would need to be in place. The, the big one is access to capital. Uh, what the coalition has been advocating for is a federal loan guarantee program modeled after the Ontario Aboriginal Loan Guarantee Program. It allows indigenous uh, communities to access capital at the government rates. Uh, in, in many cases, they, uh, these are well vetted, the projects before they're funded in the Ontario example, so that those projects will not result in a loss. The government will never, if done properly, actually pay out on those guarantees. Yes, it is carried as a liability on the government's books during that time, but that's the big one. The second thing for the Aboriginal uh, financial institutions across this country, uh, just if you aren't aware, there are a number of them across the country, uh, co corporations and companies, and in, in some cases, even banks uh, dedicated to First Nations issues and, and funding, they're all undercapitalized. There is not enough money in them for the demand that happens. So for example, that loan guarantee program in Ontario, it's oversubscribed almost instantly every time it's renewed. It just, there isn't enough uh, enough capital available. So what does the government need to do? It needs policy changes to make capital flow much easier to those organizations that support First Nations and in some cases, those uh, in, in First Nations communities who are making direct partnerships to, to allow that equity position. Uh, again, just to point out though, these done properly are not a giveaway to First Nations. It's a matter of access in the capital. And if the investments are done right, then it will be repaid. 
Uh, there's a lot of programs internationally where there's attempts to try and do things in this, everything from micro banks, micro loaning, micro lending up to large um, multi-billion dollar capital projects. Uh, Canada needs to be much more innovative about that one. And second, which I pointed out just a moment ago, there is this attitude at times that rural people or rural projects are not worthy of national attention. Uh, that's going to bite Canada badly going forward. We are a resource dependent com uh, country in the shift to clean energy, if we do not get First Nations involved in every aspect of these projects, and that means investment, the country is going to suffer. Uh, Heather Hall, a question I'm going to put to you um, about regional economic development agencies. Uh, and I see Peggy Breckveld nodding knowingly, so you'll get a shot at it next. Um, do, what how, we, we in Canada, we sort of go back and forth. Um, you know, there, there used to be a handful of regional economic development agencies, and then they were all sort of centralized together uh, under one minister so that they could be more efficient. And now they have been spread out again and multiplied so that individual regions can get better attention. And then probably in 10 years, they'll smash them together again. Um, how well do they work when it comes to promoting community level development and, and resilience? Great question. I, if I can just jump on the broadband question for a second, oh, sure. and then I'll come back to that one, because I wanted to just bring up that having the infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure, often isn't enough for a lot of our small entrepreneurs and small businesses. But being able to actually use that technology effectively and efficiently is another piece of the puzzle that we need in a lot of rural communities. And so during the pandemic, one of the really popular programs here in Ontario was the Digital Main Street, um, and it's starting to expand across the country. But really trying to get small businesses to be able to adopt digital tools and strategies and technologies and train them on how to use them effectively, because we often know a lot of our small business owners are busy, you know, working in the business and don't have a lot of time to kind of step back and work on the business and introduce these new technologies. So some of that program has... Um, access students from some of our post-secondary institutions or recent graduates and paired them with businesses to help them grow and start their digital presence. So I think that's another really important piece of that broadband um, conversation that um, also needs to be highlighted when we talk about uh, broadband issues in rural communities. As for our regional economic development institutions, I think, you know, they play a really vital role for a lot of our rural communities across the country. I think we're now up to, to seven um, and there isn't a place now in Canada that doesn't have access to a regional development institutions. But one of the challenges I would say with those regional development institutions is that the funding is often based on the priorities of whatever government might be in power versus what the needs and the priorities are of those regions. And so I think if there was an area that we could improve on is ensuring that these regional agencies have regional development plans or strategies that are actually tied to regional priorities that help guide their investments. Um, oftentimes, uh, when we look at some of these funding programs, entrepreneurs are thinking about how can I get this funded through the program versus whether or not the, the project or the initiative makes sense for the long-term development needs of a particular place. So I think working towards trying to have stronger and mo more robust plans and strategies in place could really help develop what these regional development agencies are doing on the ground in rural communities and help build that planning capacity that we also need in our rural communities. And so we have examples from around the world. Um, one of the biggest ones that rolled out in the European Union was something called Smart Specialization Strategies or S3. And they were part of the cohesion policies for the European Union. And what they were were regional strategies to support innovation and R&D. Um, they embraced a really broad view of innovation. So it could be technology related, it could be social innovation. They were also place-based, meaning that they were built on the unique uh, regional assets and resources in particular regions. They engaged regional stakeholders in the development of those. They were had to be uh, evidence-based with sound monitoring and evaluation mechanisms built into the actual plans. And they really help tie policy support and investment to key regional priorities. And so I think that that's a direction that we could look at to, to move in to make sure that the, 
the funds that we do have are tied to what those regional assets and needs are on the ground. Peggy Breckfeld, you wanted a shot at that? Sure. Uh, so before I was in this role, um, our business, our farm, actually got to use a regional development agent program, regional development program. It was a provincial one, but I think the example is still the same. What it did was our business was moving forward, but what the what the program did was move our business forward five years faster. And that's what you're looking to do is drive it, the improvements, drive the innovation faster forward. So um, I think that agencies that do this work have a responsibility to look at, at healthy uh, businesses, et cetera. Um, but if you can show a good business plan or an investment that will make a difference and support Canadian values in a region, then I think that uh, they should invest in those ways. Second thing I'll say is that for agriculture, we want to see um, investment from those regional development agencies in all parts of the food chain. Uh, we, during the pandemic, we actually saw failures in the food chain. And for the first time for many Canadians, not all Canadians, but many Canadians, they actually felt they couldn't buy the things they wanted to buy. It wasn't on the shelf. People actually saw that. And I think it supports this idea that we need to continue to uh, strengthen the food sovereignty of, of Canadian food, ensure that Canadian food can get to the shelves. And that means grocery stores need to be healthy. They, they have to have enough people working at them. Our abattoirs need to be healthy and they, they need to have processes and innovation there so that they can keep bringing the food forward. And uh, the supply chains have to be successful because I can't send the tomatoes to the market without um, some type of packaging um, in, in some kind of tag. And those things all had challenges. And on our fields, we needed labor. We really, really needed labor. So as development agencies look at things, one of the issues is finding people to work in rural Ontario and an agricultural or rural Ontario labor strategy is actually, I think, so, something that we, again, we can look at and build on to help strengthen rural economies. Uh, my attention has been drawn to the clock on the wall. Uh, so to close us out, uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Mark Podlasley. If you had you know, one minute to grab the key policymaker on the files you care about by the lapels before security dragged you off, what would you say in that one minute? What, what's the most urgent need that has to be addressed? Access to capital. Access to capital for rural and remote communities to compete in an effective national economy, international economy at that. So uh, a national sovereign loan guarantee program for Indigenous people to invest in the country. We're not spending the money on ourselves. We're plowing it back into the country. That's what I would ask for. Matt Dunn, and then Peggy Breckfeld, and then Heather Hall to finish. Matt Dunn? I would say that the future of the economy of any nation is only as strong as tapping into all the entrepreneurial spirit that's out there. And that means not just folks who happen to choose to live or are required to live in big cities, but tapping into rural entrepreneurs who are ready to find new ways to change markets and use their, uh, their, their experiences um, to be able to find new ways to do that. Um, and to not do that means we're not meeting our full potential. Peggy Breckfeld, what's your one minute grab them by the lapels demand? If you ate today, a farmer probably grew it. So food matters to you and agriculture matters to you. And we are the people who um, work the soils and the land and bring you great food of all varieties. And so we, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> Heather Hall, what's the top priority? We need to see rural development as an investment and not as a subsidy. We also need to support rural capacity to plan for rural futures. We need to invest in rural development capacity in rural communities. We need senior government staff on the ground in rural communities who understand the needs and assets in those communities. And we need to support rural institutions. 
And as Sean mentioned on the panel earlier this morning, rural communities should not be seen as passive recipients of development, but leaders in the future directions of their communities. And lastly, we need to support robust rural development frameworks that are rooted in place. Rural businesses, rural people, organizations, and leaders are experts on the needs and assets in their communities. And we need to harness and support this knowledge by having a rural lens and supporting the collection and analysis of rural data. Thank you all so very much uh, for your time, for your insights, for your being accommodating of me. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Matthew Mendelson will be back very shortly with the Minister of Rural Economic Development for Canada, Good Goody Hutchings, uh, and I am David Reevely. I am an Ottawa correspondent for The Logic. Thanks so much. Hi there, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, sorry for uh, the, the short delay. Uh, so we've had a great afternoon of uh, dialogue and conversations, and we're, uh, we're really pleased to uh, welcome the new Minister of Rural Economic Development, the Honorable uh, Goody Hutchings. Uh, she's been in the job for a few weeks, um, so it's great to get a chance to talk to her and talk to her about our day and our research. As, as you know, uh, Canada 2020 has been doing interviews and talking to people and doing workshops over the last few months, and we'll continue to do that. We put out a discussion paper uh, this week, uh, looking at policy and program ideas uh, for to support community uh, economic development in rural and smaller communities. Um, and uh, so you're kind of new to this job, but you've been involved in this space uh, for a very long time. I think people would just be interested in hearing about your experiences and your personal and professional life uh, uh, that's relevant to uh, rural economic development issues. Wonderful. Well, Matthew, thanks to you and the, and, and the Group of Canada 2020 for the invitation for today. And you know, you're right, rural has always been a passion for me. For those of you that don't know me, I live in western Newfoundland and Labrador. My riding is called the Long Range Mountains. It's absolutely beautiful. And the land mass is bigger than Switzerland. I have over 220 communities. The smallest has 42 people. The largest doesn't have 20,000 people. Uh, there's no public transit there in the main town, which is called Cornerbrook, the main city. They have two buses, so there's no public transit. Uh, there's no Uber. Um, but it's a beautiful area. Uh, there's forestry, there's mining, of course, fishery, where you live on coastal Newfoundland and Labrador, the fishery is so important. Agriculture is important. Yes, we do have incredible farming in Newfoundland. Many people say, really, I didn't know that. And of course, tourism. Tourism is incredible. I've lived there all my life, been involved in many businesses, um, family businesses in construction and uh, mining. And I branched out in the tourism sector years and years ago. Um, which has always been a passion for me. I ended up building a wilderness remote lodge in the middle of nowhere and everything had to be brought in by air or boat. So uh, I really understand the challenges of Earl and, and, but more importantly, understand the opportunities. And when the prime minister asked me to take this role as rural economic development, I was over the moon because there's nothing better that I want to get into and really make a difference. Uh, rural Canada is so important to our GDP, so important to the country, and so important for our people. And I'm just so excited, and I was honored and privileged when he asked me to take on the role as minister of this department. Um, so we've we've talked about a lot of issues. I'm not gonna ask you lots of questions about uh, lots of uh, the, the issues at the moment, but I did want to uh, poke a little bit on uh, on uh, your point that um, obviously you are very familiar uh, with uh, rural communities and industry and economic development there. Uh, is there anything over the last 20 months, because I think all of us have been reflecting uh, on our own lives, our own situations, uh, how we do things, how we manage our affairs, how we spend our time, how we earn our living. I know I certainly have. And um, uh, you have so much experience uh, in uh, running a business in a small community. Is there anything over the last 20 months that has struck you uh, in terms of learnings or uh, new insights about, uh, you know, what the pandemic has meant for rural communities and whether that means threats that, you know, you may not have appreciated previously or new opportunities? Um, what are your reflections on the last 20 months? Matthew, I think 
the biggest thing that we can all realize, and I'm sure we'll all agree on this one, is that the whole issue of connectivity came to the forefront. Connectivity was an issue long before the pandemic, but the pandemic ripped the Band-Aid off. Where now we, we were forced into working from home, children were doing their homework around the kitchen table, you were accessing your online services, you know, to, to keep in touch. Um, healthcare in rural Canada is very much done remotely, uh, safety, and basically, you know, letting grandma say hi to the kids. So connectivity was brought to the forefront. And one thing our government did, and I was so proud of, is we were launching the Universal Broadband Fund at the time, but we added to that a component called the Rapid Response Stream. And that was able to get money out the door, smaller projects of $5 million and less, and it was going to communities that had zero or terrible internet to give them a boost to get up and going. Um, so I'm delighted that our government has a plan on internet and connectivity, and we are well underway. Uh, I've had so many briefings on this, and I get great delight when I hear that, yes, Minister, we are going to reach our commitment of making of connecting 98% of Canada by 2026 and the rest of the country by 2030. And look, if I can get it out the door even earlier and we can get stuff done, areas connected earlier, I will certainly do that. You know, the, that's vital now. Connectivity is vital. And it's proven that if you have a great internet connection, you can work from anywhere, do anything. I think that's going to be the positive thing of seeing growth in rural Canada. Um, I, so that's a theme that came up a lot uh, during the day today. Um, I would say that the connectivity piece, but also the access to capital, access to capital for uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprise, small businesses in rural communities, for Indigenous-led uh, businesses as well. That was Those were two themes that continued to pop up, the connectivity and, and the access to capital. I wanted to ask you about uh, I mean, those targets that you mentioned. That's, that's fabulous that... Uh, uh, you're you're on track for that. What I'm wondering, because I know you you may be a new minister, but you've been around this portfolio for for a long time, and you were involved with the creation of the uh, of uh, the government's rural economic development strategy in 2019 that was put out, and you put out an update uh, uh, over the course of the summer. Um, I'm wondering again, just thinking about the pandemic, um, you were involved in the creation of that. Um, and obviously connectivity was an important part of that. Um, uh, if you look back at that strategy now with you know, the outcomes of the pandemic, um, are there things that you think we missed, you missed, the government missed, or that we now know, uh, or things that need to be prioritized in a different way, or things that need to be added now that we know the realities of what we've experienced over the last 20 months? That's a great question, Matthew. And if anything, the pandemic has made us realize that the elements in that strategy, they're much more urgent now. We've got to get on. You know, we know how important tourism is. It's a key economic driver. It's 50% of the tourism sector is in rural Canada. We And there's a huge growth potential there. And Minister Boissonneau has been incredible. Uh, matter of fact, I met with him again this morning of how can we get the funds out to the communities that really need it in rural. Um, and we've also seen Canadians kind of rediscover our own land, which is pretty amazing. You know, as I've said, I live in Western Newfoundland and the people that have said, oh my golly, I never knew it was so beautiful here. So I think we're rediscovering other parts of our country in the last 18 months. And we've really got to continue to build on that. And we've got to invest in that sector because that sector is going to ground us for going forward as well. Also, we've got to do more about immigration. We hear so much about immigration and housing. And the two go hand in hand, right? But we've got to make sure that we invest in these communities so that when we bring in immigrant families in, there is housing. We do, you know, lots of rural Canada is an aging population. So we need to make sure that we tweak our immigration programs, that we can bring people in. And I'm a firm believer in bring people in in a unit. Uh, my grandfather came from Sweden, oh my golly, over 100 years ago now, but they came as a family unit and they settled in the town. I think in rural, in rural parts of the country, if we can bring um, immigrant families in as a unit, I think they'll be you know, around people with their own culture and traditions, and then it'll be easier for them to, to meld into the local community. As we all know, rural communities are, are so loving and outgoing and welcoming, but if you're bringing your own culture and tradition, it's, it's nice to have someone around you. And of course, we've got to make sure 
that the rural communities that, like I said earlier, rely on agriculture and fishing and farming and forestry, that we they're the key economic drivers and we've got to support them and think outside the box of how we make them grow. 30% of the GDP comes from rural Canada. I'd like to see that number climb up. And it's 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 once we get connectivity, connectivity is the silver bullet in helping all these industries grow and expand more and do more things for rural Canada. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned uh, Randy Boissonneau. Many people are watching this. They may not know. I, I think he's the Minister for Tourism right now. Um, and, uh, you know, there are so many integrated issues. Um, and we talked a lot over the course of the afternoon about the regional development agencies and the uh, now that there are uh, unique individual ministers responsible for each of the RDAs. And I imagine you and Randy and the other ministers of the RDAs are working very closely together uh, on all of these issues because so many of these issues are horizontal and complex um, and require more than more than one uh, ministry. I'm going to ask you one final question um, uh, before we go. I know you have votes um, and, and all, and uh, it's busy. Um, I've been around public policy discussions for, for a long time, as you have. Um, and certainly in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, but in Atlantic Canada and many parts of rural Canada, the last 20 or 30 years, a focus has been we're losing people, people are moving to cities, um, uh, there aren't as many economic opportunities here. Uh, and I think over the last number of years, that narrative, at least publicly, is starting to be challenged and questioned. And it uh, certainly our discussions this afternoon seem to focus a lot on rural innovation, rural entrepreneurship, um, and, uh, and uh, rising quality of life and standard of living in rural communities. So I'm wondering whether you think uh, the last 20 months, but uh, you know, uh, at a longer time horizon, uh, we're at a moment where rural communities have um, uh, uh, that, that some of the advantages of cities have uh, have turned on their head a bit um, and that there are real opportunities for rural communities right now and how the government can kind of support that. Matthew, what a phenomenal question. And I am so excited to answer it because yes, I agree with you 100%. These last 18, 20 months has, folk, has, has really made us refocus and, and revisit some of our lives. Uh, I know my son and his uh, girlfriend moved from downtown Toronto to a rural part of the world. They didn't come to Newfoundland, but that's okay. But I think, and that was their, that was their key. It was like, you know what, we can now work from anywhere. So we've got to listen to communities. I think that's so key in all this, Matthew. We've got to listen to communities from the ground up and say, what does your community need to make it healthier, to make you attract people to come in? Is your infrastructure great? Is your connectivity as we addressed? Are, are the goods and services that you offer in your town, how can we help you? build on those. And just to comment on infrastructure, we've got to make sure that we're building for the future. We've got to make sure that we're putting in infrastructure that's going to address these climate change issues that are going to happen over, you know, we, we know climate change is real. So we've got to make sure that we're addressing the infrastructure issues, but we've got to make sure that we're building healthy communities that people are going to want to move into. Frankly, and I say it all the time, I'm a firm believer that once people get out and experience rural, as long as you can have great services and amenities that you need, access to good health care, good schools for your children and services, I think people are going to say, wow, the life in rural Canada is pretty special. Like people say to me all the time, how can you, uh, how do you like living in Ottawa? And I said, oh, no, no, I don't live in Ottawa. I work in Ottawa. I live in rural Newfoundland and I'm proud to say it. So the, the potential for growth in rural is amazing. I think the key is working all together. And if I can quote something from your document, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Because far too often, I don't, I've, I've said to my team, I don't want to hear the word rural lens anymore. I want to hear about rural programs and rural policy and how we're actually going to get rural results. But I love in your document, you say government policies have often focused on rural as places to subsidize instead of places that continue and can thrive and innovate. And that's going to be my mantra. So I'm going to borrow that from your document, if you don't mind, because I really see this as an opportunity now to show what rural Canada can do for Canadians, for people that want to move to these areas and be a great attraction for people all over the world, frankly. 
Well, thank you very much for that. We have quite a big network of people who've been engaged in uh, this process, um, uh, re researchers, practitioners, business owners, um, a variety of people who do community development. They've all been uh, involved in this dialogue over the last uh, few months and over the course of the afternoon. It was great to hear you um, and great for you to join us uh, for a little bit. And I know people here uh, and we will will stay in touch and keep you informed of, uh, of what we're doing. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Matthew. And that's how we're going to make a difference in rural, by everybody throwing our ideas on the table, working together. That's how we'll truly make a difference for all Canadians in rural Canada. And I'm looking forward to working with you and all your team here. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye now. So we're going to uh, wrap up. Uh, I think we've had a, a great afternoon um, uh, as uh, people here on this call know uh, who've been participating in discussions and workshops and interviews over the course of, uh, of the summer and fall. Uh, we will be continuing to engage and build out from the discussion paper uh, over, the next, uh, over the next few months. And to close things off, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Jacob Glick, uh, Vice President, Public Policy at TELUS. Thanks very much, Matthew. And uh, thank you uh, for the really thoughtful work that you have put in into producing the think piece that has sparked some really interesting conversation today and to the whole Canada 2020 team and to your colleagues at Springboard Policy as well. Uh, I'm joining this meeting from Ottawa, which is on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. And uh, of course, I also want to thank the panelists, the moderators, the minister for some really thoughtful, engaged discussions today. I personally learned a lot from these researchers, leaders, practitioners about the opportunities and the challenges facing rural Canada. You tell us you might think of as a um, as a connectivity company, the, the, the one connectivity company uh, company in Canada that has good customer service. But we are also a social purpose company. And part of that social purpose is the belief that digital connectivity is a critical enabler to improved well-being and economic opportunity for Canadians, and especially for Canadians who live in rural Canada. And it's that, it's that reason, that belief in rural Canada in particular, that underpins our investments in TELUS agriculture, in TELUS health, and in the billions and billions of dollars that we have put into uh, bringing connectivity to rural and remote parts of Canada. Uh, and it is not just the belief that you bring connectivity as an end in itself, but rather connectivity and agriculture, uh, uh, agricultural technology and health technology are enablers for the kinds of social outcomes that we are looking for as a country. Social and economic inclusion, indigenous reconciliation, sustainable food production and production and addressing climate, all issues that we discussed today. So we are very pleased at TELUS to be able to support the research that you, Matthew, and the team in Canada 2020 are undertaking here uh, and to help shape a better set of outcomes for the millions of Canadians who live and thrive in rural communities and that TELUS has the privilege of being able to serve. The last thing I'll say is that there will be lots of collaborations that are made possible by this Canada 2020 project. But if somebody has an idea for one and you can't wait until the next time we are together as a group, you should please reach out to me directly because uh, I'm personally very committed to continuing to advance these and uh, we are, our whole TELUS team is as well. So please reach out. So thank you, Canada 2020. Uh, thank you all the participants and um, we'll see you around the internet and hopefully in person eventually. <laughs>